business meeting open. Um, I'll just see if, if anyone's coming into the public today before I give out the information about digital devices. I think that's us. Um, I'll just make a comment on the use of electronic devices in the room today. Anyone in the public gallery must turn mobile phones off. Mobile tablet devices can, however, be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted. Password details are available in the gallery for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. Uh, members, just to remind yourselves, if you could um, turn your phones off, please. Um, just to start off the meeting, um, any apologies? I have one. Paula's obviously not here, different person in the chair. Um, Paula has a personal matter, and, and I think just on behalf of all the committee, we send our, our, our warmest regards to her, just to, with things that, that are going on at the moment. Um, any other apologies? I think we're all here today. Um, so, if we'll crack on with business then today, I'll refer you to the draft minutes from the 13th of February at page... Sorry, Sorry. <clears throat> just a chairperson's business there. I just had an issue I wanted to raise. I know obviously Paul is not here, but um, and we'll come to the correspondence later in the pack, but um, I just wanted to raise the issue of, of Paula's attendance at, at Ravenhill. Um, I thought we agreed that we wouldn't go on any solar runs in this committee, and um, to my knowledge, everybody's abided by that. Um, and I think, you know, we... We reprimanded the minister, and rightly so, a couple of weeks ago for, for her solar run. So I think we, the committee's owed an explanation. I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm the party's folks are for culture, art and sports, but I wouldn't go and visit a stadium or, or a sports organisation in any other capacity other than in that role. No so it's just to make the point, no, Paul's not here, but yeah. I, think, I think the committee needs an explanation. We'll certainly get that from Paula whenever she's back to commit, because it was obviously just her that was, was along to that. Yeah. Um, so I'll bring you back then to the minutes of the 13th of February at page 6 of your meeting pack. Um, are you content with those um, minutes? Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Um, so agenda item 3, matters arising. Um, I'm going to refer you now to the departmental response to a committee request for information in the budget bill, which is at page 19 of your pack. Um, so, take it to that. You've also been provided with, um, at page 25, an excerpt from the Northern Ireland Springs Supplementary Estimates Report from the Department of Finance, as well as a copy of the Vote on Account at page 47. If anybody's looking for a full copy of um, the supplement and the, the Vote on Account, you can collect those from the business office. Um, members have, all we have also been provided with a tabled research paper um, on Assembly Committee engagement on 2020 to 2021 departmental budget planning. Um, so we have that um, for us. The debate on the spring supplementary estimates is scheduled for Monday the 24th of February and the debate in the second stage of the budget bill is scheduled for the 25th of February. Um, members, the chair would normally speak during the debate on behalf of the committee and if Paula is available she will do that. Um, if not then I'll represent her, I'll deputise for her as chair of the committee simply to reflect the information provided by the department. I'll also speak in general terms about um, the short term priorities that require funding and that would be the bedroom tax and the fact that we do welcome this. Um, I'll note that the committee will work closely with the department on its priorities and the associated funding. Um, are members content with that approach? Yes, Chair, and just to say that each of us will probably speak as folks people in our own right to that as well. Okay, that's absolutely, yeah. Um, notwithstanding all of that, would the members still wish to or want to receive a briefing on budgetary matters from the department at a future meeting, bearing in mind that the budget number two bill is before the summer? Um, so we would like to get that, yeah. that briefing from the department. Yeah. Yeah. So we'll get that arranged. Just on another matter, um, last week it was discussed about having our um, strategic planning day on the 5th of March, but we need to factor in briefings from two more deputy secretaries. Um, would you be content if we have those first and then move our planning day to the 12th of March? Yeah, fine. Yeah, because I think we need to hear from people before um, we, we actually go forward for that strategic planning by day. Sorry. Um, so agenda item four then we move on to is the correspondence. Um, the correspondence memo is at page 55 of your pack. Um, 
And I'm referring actually now to one that the member has already brought up, um, the Ulster Rugby um, and the Kingspan Stadium. Um, would you be content to hold a meeting in Kingspan Stadium at some yeah. stage before Easter? Yeah. Yeah. And the other issue, we'll make sure that that's responded to whenever Paul yeah. is back. Um, and just then to check, are you content to action all the other correspondences <coughs> outlined on the correspondence memo? Yes. Um, I'll draw you. I had... Um, a, I'd been contacted at the CIH. I was minded to meet them, but I would rather do that with the agreement of the committee. Um, and to be honest, at this stage, before I would go back to CIH, and just to say, does anybody else want to attend? I can go back to Justin and say, if anybody wants to have a meeting with him, or bring him here. Just bring him here. Bring him here. No problem. Yeah. No problem. Um, just also to let you know that um, tomorrow evening, this is Thursday, tomorrow evening, Friday, um, CIH are having their awards ceremony um, on housing matters. I was attending that as an MLA. Mm -hmm. um, they were then in contact with me yesterday evening in a mad panic to ask if I would present one of their awards, the last award. Um, I'm not speaking or anything like that, and I've said to them I prefer not do it as deputy chair because the chair should really have been invited to that. Um, I've asked them for clarification if Paula was invited to maybe do that. Maybe she's one, isn't it? Sorry? Or maybe maybe she's you're one. presenting it to her. <laughs> um, but they haven't come back to me to confirm it, but I have made it clear to CIH that everything should come through the committee clerks as opposed to directly to um, myself. Um, just then moving on, if members are content, to item number five, which is a departmental briefing on welfare reform, and I'd like to invite Anne McCleary and David Tarr to the table, please. And members, a copy of the Northern Ireland Welfare Supplementary Payment Schemes is included at page 76, and a review of welfare mitigation schemes at page 78. <coughs> Welcome again, folks, to the committee. Thank you. Um, and can I just check that we, we don't appear to have a briefing for the committee um, for this, this session. Is yeah. there any reason for that? Well, uh, the reason is, firstly, I apologise if you're expecting one. Um, and secondly, to be honest, we've been doing an awful lot of work in working with the legislation. And it slipped, so I apologise for that. Um, Thank you. Um, we'll make sure that that's resolved <coughs> in the future. Thank you very much. Um, um, please proceed. I know in the past um, few weeks we have been quite liberal with our time yes. um, for officers, um, given that we don't have a briefing today. Um, yes. Normally where there would be 10 minutes, I'm happy and content if members are to, to allow a bit longer for that. So yes. um, we'll give you that time, but we'll try and, and yes. keep things. Well, I think the plan is I'm just going to give you a fairly quick introduction and then we'll take questions. I'm imagining that that's really the bulk of what today is about. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, if I can just recap on how we got where we are. The Northern Ireland Executive set out an agreed approach to implementing welfare reform in this place, including the allocation from executive funds to top up UK welfare arrangements in Northern Ireland. That funding was for a four year period from 2016 17 through to the 2019 20 financial year. As agreed, in the Fresh Start Agreement, the Executive agreed to establish a small working group under the leadership of, of Professor Eileen Evison to bring forward proposals within the agreed financial envelope, including administrative costs, to maximise the use of those additional resources. The Welfare Reform Mitigations Working Group published its report in January 2016. The report included recommendations for the delivery of a number of welfare mitigation payment schemes. The working group estimated that mitigation scheme payments would cost £501 million over four years, in other words, until 31st of March this year. The current mitigation schemes were developed following the recommendations made by that working group. These schemes provide for mitigation in the form of welfare su supplementary payments to claimants who experience a loss of benefit following the introduction of certain welfare reforms. Regulations are in place to provide welfare supplementary payments for claimants impacted by benefit cap, social sector size criteria, time limiting of contribution based employment and support allowance, disability living allowance to personal independence payment reassessment, that includes <coughs> loss of 
carer payments and loss of disability related premiums. Depending on their circumstances, claimants may be eligible for more than one WSP. Claimants are not required to apply for a payment as the department identifies eligible claimants and makes payments to them automatically. As such, the department is satisfied that welfare supplementary payments have been made to all eligible claimants. WSPs are time limited, with payments in respect of the loss of ill health, disability and carer payments normally available for up to one year. Welfare supplementary payments in respect of losses owing to the benefit cap and social sector size criteria are however available for up to four years. However, there is no provision for mitigation payments currently to be made beyond 31 March 2020. This is the so-called cliff edge. In recognition of the complexity of welfare changes, the Executive also committed a further £8 million of funding for the provision of additional independent advice services until 31 March 2020. These additional services were intended to help and support claimants through the transitional period of change to the welfare system. The Working Group also recommended that £2 million a year be made available for the provision of emergency financial support to alleviate short-term hardship suffered by universal credit claimants until 31 March 2020. In response to this recommendation, the Department introduced a universal credit contingency fund to provide emergency payments for universal credit claimants to alleviate financial hardship that has occurred as a result of difficulties not due to any fault on the part of the claimant. The contingency fund was introduced with effect from 1 November 2017 and payments were made in the form of non-repayable grants. In the absence of the Assembly and given the timetable for the introduction of the contingency fund, it wasn't possible to bring forward specific legislation for this scheme and payments are currently made using the legislative provisions of the Discretionary Support Regulations Northern Ireland 2016. In order to receive a Universal Credit Contingency Fund payment, claimants must have exhausted all other it used to be that they must have exhausted all other means of financial support, for example, claimed a universal credit advance payment. They also had to be either in their first or second universal credit assessment period until the date that the first payment due for the first assessment period is made. However, as of January this year, you will be aware that the criteria has changed so that it is no longer necessary to have applied for an advance payment. And I think that's a, a key change here. For the period May 2016 to September 18, £93.6 million has been paid out to over 60,000 claimants as welfare mitigation payments. As part of Fresh Start, the Executive committed to a review of the welfare mitigation funding package in 2018-19. This was not a statutory requirement, however the review was laid in March 2019 and was followed by a series of open events at which the review was discussed. The review was primarily intended to inform and provide an analytical basis on possible options moving forward to provide advice to an incoming minister. We were and are clear that any decision to continue mitigation payments required and will require both funding and new legislation. That review concluded that the evidence showed that the ending of the social sector size criteria mitigation would affect 34,000 claimants on the 1st of April 2020 and that there was strong evidence supporting the need to look at options for continuing the social sector size criteria mitigations and some justification for looking at options for the continuation of the benefit cap mitigations. The review also concluded that the Department would not be able to make the necessary amendments to the existing mitigations legislation in the absence of a functioning assembly. That's because the social sector size criteria mitigation required amendment to primary legislation, that is, the Welfare Reform Northern Ireland Order 2015, and the other mitigations require amending regulations, which would be subject to the affirmative resolution procedure in the Assembly. There was considerable interest shown in what was happening here in Whitehall, and consequently the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the Work and Pension Committee established a joint inquiry into the welfare reform going on in Northern Ireland. Officials gave evidence to the inquiry on the 1st of July 2019, and the inquiry published its report some months later, <coughs> recommending that the existing mitigations be extended for four years. More recently, 
the new decade new approach agreement confirmed the extension of the existing mitigations and committed to a review. In the last few weeks, the Minister has announced that the Executive has agreed the introduction of legislation to extend the social sector size criteria mitigation, and she has committed to bringing forward legislation in relation to the other existing mitigations. So that's really where we stand at the minute, and we're more than happy to take. I'm sure there are lots of questions that you all have. Thank you very much. Um, I'll kick off like this having this chair's prerogative. Um, the Department published a forecast of the claimants who would be affected by the mitigation measures when they ended on March 31st. Um, there were just over 40,000 people. Um, the vast majority of those were um, people affected by the social size criteria, mm -hmm. around 32,000, although the Minister has said it's more like 38,000. Can you give us an update on how many people um, will be affected in total? David. Yes, so yeah, the, the figures that the Department published um, at the end of 2019, and we have previously provided to MLAs, was 32,000. The latest estimate is 38,000. Uh, the reason for that is we obviously our analysts in the department continue to evaluate this and just uh, you know they're, they're constantly refining the analysis that we do and the additional six thousand now is an estimate of people who will come on or come on probably is the wrong phrase who will be affected by the bedroom tax at some point during the next uh, financial year but maybe only for a short period uh, and then go off again so it, it, they're now estimating about thirty eight thousand in total at some point in the next financial year 2020 but <coughs> one will be affected but that could be for a few weeks. Uh, the estimate is that about 32,000 would be affected for the entire year. Okay. Um, the Minister has also stated to the committee that the overall cost to extending the entire mitigation package is around 42 million, with the bedroom tax being around 32 million. Um, can you give us a breakdown of the measures that will be extended, the number of people this will include in each, and the cost of each individual measure? Again, David, yeah. Figures. Okay, Thank so you. the, the, the latest estimates that we have here, and uh, excuse me, I will just um, read these out here. So for 2020-2021, our current estimates uh, for the benefit cap, 1,600 uh, households. The, this could be individual claimants or it could be a household. So I'm just going to refer to as households. The, the social sector size criteria, the bedroom tax, 38,000. Um, what we term raising 16, so this is children who are currently receiving a DLA who would be um, moving over to PIP or in this case, not moving to Pippet, um, about 1,070. Um, CARES, who, uh, so this is people who provide care for those children, uh, who are currently receiving DLA, uh, and who would then lose their CARES premiums or CARES allowance, about 890 people. Um, and then getting into the, the loss of DLA, which has uh, three elements to it. Um, so you have the, the PIP disallowed. So this is, um, these are people who are, are, all the assessments have been done, so these are people who are currently have their appeals ongoing, so their payments would otherwise end. Uh, 956 <coughs> is our uh, very precise estimate. Um, the PIP reduction, um, we're looking at 2,976 people. Um, and then linked to those, uh, sorry, there is also the third element, which is the conflict-related injury. The numbers of those are very small, so the, our analysts can't predict those. Uh, the estimate is it'll be less than 10. Um, adult disability premiums, so these are your premiums paid on your income-based benefits. Um, 1,458 people and CARERS, these are people who are currently receiving a CARER payment not linked to the raising 16s, 453 people. So a total of 47,400. Now, when we say the total of 47,400, that is just adding those up. There could be people yeah. uh, that will be receiving multiple. Um, and sure, I will just run through then the, the, the financial estimates for the next financial year. So the benefit cap, we're talking 3.5 million. Uh, obviously, we can provide these tables to the, to the committee afterwards. Um, so the social sector size criteria, uh, the estimate here, 23.3 million. The raising 16s, the children transferring from DLA to PIP, uh, 3.7 million. The CARES for the raising 16s, 2.1 million. Um, and then the, for the loss of the DLA, um, the PIP disallowed. Um, 1.3 million, the PIP reduction 1.4 million, the adult disability premiums 1.9 million, um, and then the CARERS uh, 0.5 million. Included in the, 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 the department's assessment and the bid, I understand, is we made the Department of Finance is approximately £4 million pounds for additional IT and admin costs. That's the, the theme of the department who delivers these payments, and there are enhancements required to the, the IT systems. 
Uh, thank you. Before I move on to questions from the rest of, of um, the committee, there was an independent review of PIP assessment carried out by Walter Rader in 2018. There were 14 recommendations come out of that report. What has been done in the department to implement those? Well, the department has been looking at them and a number of those recommendations have been Im implemented. For example, the uh, recommendations in relation to audio recording. Um, and I know that there's another review which is about to begin, which is the, the further review. Um, I can come back to you with de details as to what precisely has the response has been, but I know that uh, it's been, it has been looked at and a number of the recommendations have already been implemented. I don't have the detail, a lot of it is op operational. It would be good to get that yeah. update um, and also um, if we can maybe get what the criteria is for the new review going forward and how co-production and co-design okay. will be built into that, that would be good. Um, I'll move on to the other committee members this year. Johnny, you come in. Thank you, uh, Chair, uh, and thank you, Anne, for your uh, report so far. Um, Page 104 of your report and the additional support provided by the independent advice sector. I know the executive commitment of eight million for that sector. Um, could you maybe elaborate in terms of if you were rolling out the scheme again, would you do it the same way, and what challenges you found? Um, David, would you like to? Uh, uh, I can give some information on. Uh, I, this is really uh, uh, belongs to a different deputy secretary part mm -hmm. of the department, so I, I am aware because I have. Uh, um, on some work on the steering group that looked at this. Uh, the department has uh, obviously commissioned the Strategic Investment Board to complete a review um, of the, the effectiveness of the advice sector funding. Um, I'm not sure if the committee has been briefed on the outcome of that yet, so I'm not entirely certain how much information uh, I can disclose, but I think the, the findings were quite positive um, in terms of the funding. The department is obviously preparing um, submissions for our minister and what funding we think we would require for the advice sector going forward. Uh, but I think the, the, certainly the signs that we, the indications we've got to date is that the, the funding that was there was necessary. Um, it maybe hasn't gone to the, uh, sorry, the number of inquiries hasn't panned out the way they were maybe predicted to in the working group report, obviously with universal credit coming through slower, but there were additional inquiries, particularly around PIP and the transition to PIP than maybe we than were expected to start with. Um, so I think overall the department's view is that the money has, was important. Uh, and it certainly has been uh, it has delivered on what we, it was intended to do. And do you feel that if, if doing this again, you would roll that funding out in the same manner as what you, what you did? That is probably another uh, comment for me to make at this point in time. It, as I say, there is uh, uh, submissions going to our minister with recommendations for how this would look going forward. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's fairly safe to say that the department uh, recognises there is a need for additional mm -hmm. Uh, advice support uh, with welfare reform continuing. With, with some complexities that was found in terms of a change to citizens' advice and uh, risk rating, you moved towards a more council collaborative approach. Uh, how did you find that? Again, it's not, it's not really. It's not a, I am aware of that, but uh, it would be another directorate uh, who no specialises. Sorry, sorry, I can't, I can't really go into. No problem. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Um, we're just saying there. We'll maybe get a briefing on that. Okay. Yeah. Um, Carol, you've indicated this. Yes, thank you, Chair. Thank you, David. Thank you, Anne. Um, so, um, I, I'm just a bit confused at, for example, um, estimates around reduction in PIPs. You know, how, how do you come to those um, conclusions? Is this our estimate of the number of people who will continue to be affected? Yeah. What we're doing is we're looking at the number of people who are on. Obviously, we're getting very close to the 31st of March. So what our analysts can do is there we know obviously how many people are currently receiving the payments. The PIP assessments have been completed, is my understanding. Uh, so everybody who was on DLA, as in an adult, not a, a child, who will, we constantly have the raising 16s as we term them. Obviously, children are turning 16 all the time, yeah. continually. But for all the, the adults, the people who were on DLA at the time when the mitigations review was, uh, or mitigations recommendations were made, they have all gone through their assessments. A number of them are still have ongoing appeals, or they have a PIP reduction case, which is time limited to a year. Mm -hmm. So we can tell, for example, if it's a PIP reduction case, we can tell if they've been on it for <coughs> two months, six months. We know <coughs> clearly how long they have to go. When it comes to the ones who have PIP disallowance, we are estimating how long their appeal will last. Um, their appeals may, it may come through before the end of March. Uh, for some of them, that will be the case, so those numbers may change. It is uh, an estimate by our analysts. Okay, on so, um, so you already have the figure that 
over 60% of people who have paid a decision on PIP are successful. Mm -hmm. Is that built into your estimates? For the point of view of the mitigations, <coughs> no, because all, all the mitigation is interested in is how long until the appeal is heard. Um, when if the appeal is successful uh, and somebody's got a PIP disallowance, then the department will offset uh, recover. Okay. Um, so th that's really getting into the financial side. Okay. Center. So, and maybe um, you can, I don't know if you can answer this or David, but I'm interested that SIB did a review into advice sector funding. Have SIB did a review into capita? I don't, I'm don't not aware. So. I think they should. Well, we'll report that back. I think they should because the experience of constituents right across the board. Um, I, I know some of your people were at the the event last week. Um, you see us. Yeah, you see us, and that was really around universal credit. Mm -hmm. But between universal credit, um, PEP assessments, going through the whole system. One word that keeps just repeating itself is humiliation, and particularly when people are going through PIP assessments by capita, um, for most of the time. Now there are some people who felt that they were treated with dignity and, in, mm -hmm. and integrity, and that, that's yeah. important to say that. But consistently across the board, the the complaints and people feel that. Um, that there was no empathy, there was no compassion, and that I think that needs to have a serious. I'll just say at the outset, I, I, nobody wants anyone to have to go. And, and I am saying that, and yes. on the basis that, I appreciate like that. last week, there are certain things we can do that aren't going to cost mm -hmm. a pile of money. But from electoral representatives like myself, yeah. it jars with me that they, I have no issue with anybody getting reviewed. I think you know if you're doing your work and you're doing it well. Reviews are a positive experience because what you do well will come out. Yes. And if there's something you need to do better, then dead on, that's yes. fair enough. But I do think it jars that the independent advice sector who've been working under extreme pressure are getting a high level SIB review um, and the operation of something like Capita. Now, if we get the terms of reference, that's fine. I'm not arguing against reviews. Mm -hmm. I just think when it's in that context. It doesn't sit well on. Okay. So, and then the other aspect that, in, that you know, we're, we're dealing with almost residual debt for people because of the way this system's working. Yeah. And we need to try and close the gaps. And I think we're all from that space, which is a good place to be. We need to close these gaps. But we also need to make sure that the information that people are getting and the way in which it can access that information yeah. needs to be consistent, and it hasn't been. So we heard that last week. Yes, I've we'll been hearing that. that. Yes. And if there's anything <coughs> that we need to do, or any, just let us know. But already we know that, you know, without um, continuation of funding, not just for the independent advice sector, but even for the community and voluntary sector, mm -hmm. and for advocates, um, particularly for, uh, for the most vulnerable, that needs to be prioritised, as well as payments. I would be hopeful that that kind of thing will come up in the okay. review that we're going to do in the future. Okay. So that, that can be part if, of if we could have some of the figures that were given, and if we could have some of the criteria for those reviews, I, I think we, we would all appreciate those. Thank you. Just to follow up on that, I was going to, to, to continue on from Carol. Um, Capita announced on their website that they had secured a two-year extension to its PIP assessment contract, but given the fact that you know, claimants moving from DLA <coughs> have happened, it's only the new people coming through now. Um, I know that there are assessments and there's recurring things coming up, but what are they contracted to do? Is there any way we can see what they have been asked to do? Um, because it just I don't know why they've got an extra two year contract. We, we can refer that back to the op operational side of the department. Okay, it's thirty three million pounds, so that's a lot of money um to be investing into capita whenever the expected number of assessments is is reducing. I think they're contracted to do other services by other departments. <coughs> but for us we need to, we need to find out exactly what they're well, we'll refer that query on to yeah. the commercial side, I think, who are involved yeah, in that. Impressive. Appreciate that. Thank you. Just as Carol has mentioned there, um, the debt issue, um, we're very aware that um, the Universal Credit Contingency Fund mm -hmm. hasn't, has an underspend right. attached to it. How much of the £7 million that was allocated for the Universal Credit Contingency Fund ha has been allocated? 
um, to people through the, for that first five weeks? Um, right, I have to do. I, I have these broke down by years, so excuse me if I don't try to do a quick sum in my head. Um, but for the financial year, uh, seventeen eighteen, obviously Universal Credit only going live towards the end of twenty seventeen. Um, there was seven. There's only seventeen thousand pounds spent um, in the eighteen nineteen financial year. It was five hundred seventy two thousand. Um, and the most up-to-date figures we have from April up until the end of January this year, 594,000. Um, okay, so it's, so it's, it's... You're probably roughly at about a quarter of the, of the budget. Yeah. Very and, quick. and what happens with that budget then? Is it gone? Hand it back? Rolls yeah, forward? Well, the, 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 that is, uh, Obviously, this is all coming from the block grant, as you will be aware. So, none of the money, any of the money that we can't, that isn't spent in mitigation, so my understanding comes cycles back to the Department of Finance. Uh, it isn't, and I know this has been a concern raised by uh, some uh, MLAs that the, the money it doesn't stay. And certainly, in the last four years, hasn't stayed within the mitigations pot, if you like. Um, that's to do with accounting practices, which I, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in. Um, but that's my the way it's been explained to me is that money goes back to the Department of Finance, so it's not lost. To the block, but it is effectively lost if you like to the mitigations. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Robin. You'd indicate it. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Welcome back again to the committee. Um, maybe can I can I first of all pay tribute um, to the staff at the appeals service. Uh, I do find them extremely helpful. Thank you. Um, who would? Um, uh, mm -hmm. I, I do find them extremely helpful and uh, responsive to telephone calls and uh, trying as best I can to provide uh, information. I do also find it difficult um, on the other side uh, to understand the very large time scales between, um, and I do think, however that is brought about, I do think that needs to be addressed. The, the period of time when an applicant is waiting um, can be a very worrying period of time. And I do think that that does need to be. But just uh, if capita has been referred to, there, um, <clears throat> I find one of the major gaps is that when uh, capita are assessing someone uh, for PIP who may have mental health mm -hmm. issues, they are assessing them um, against the uh, ten, the two descriptors, the ten areas of, of the descriptors, yeah. uh, and indeed that <coughs> unless unless the applicant has brought information with them, mm -hmm. then it's unlikely in a mental health case that the assessor from Capita mm -hmm. could begin to fully understand the, the situation. And then if they don't meet, if the applicant doesn't actually meet the, the uh, criteria and the points, they are refused and then wonder whether or not they have the right of an appeal now. Mm -hmm. Obviously the department tells them they have a right, but having been through an assessment, having waited a period of time, then you can understand that particularly those in a mental health situation uh, are facing challenging uh, circumstances. question really then is <coughs> around uh, where you've referred to the carers at 5.21 5 of your uh, report. Uh, I don't quite understand it. It, it reads... Well, look it up. Yep. Page 98 of our, our, our file. Uh, claimants in receipt of carer payments may lose entitlement if the person they provide care for is not entitled to the daily living component of personal independence payment following disability <coughs> living allowance to change to personal independence assessment. Can I just say, does that mean that indeed? If the person is still getting uh, the mobility component, that the carer will or may be entitled to 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 retain the carer payment. 
The car um, premiums uh, which are paid on car's allowance are tied, if you like, to the the, the daily living component or the. Uh, the car component of it was under DLA and the yeah. living component, so it wouldn't be the mobility component. In my understanding, does not entitle you to that. Um, you, there would be circumstances where an individual could be caring for one <coughs> person. You can only claim cars loans for caring for one person. So if they if they were caring for multiple people and one was to lose their DLA, then they may still qualify if they were caring for somebody else. Okay, so probably fairly what, unlikely to be fair. That's, that's why the may is in there. So if if it's a car on a one to one basis who doesn't meet the the the, 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 the daily living components lost, then the car loses no. it. Yes. Okay, so that's what may means. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Chair. Um, just to follow up on Robin's question, the Ombudsman lost, launched an investigation into the way the department administers um, PIP payments. Could you update us on where that investigation is at the moment? Well, it hasn't concluded, as far as I'm aware. I know that uh, the department has been working with the Ombudsman's office on providing information and so on, but it's still, on, it's still ongoing. I don't know how long it's going to last. The last I heard, it was suggested that this investigation may take a year. But it began, was it last summer? It could even have been the summer before, to be honest. There's been a lot ha happening, but it's going to last, I think, about a year. Yeah, we'll get an update then on that. Yeah, yeah I thought so. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just a lot, has, a lot of water has passed know, since um, then. It's hard to remember. Yeah. No problem. Um, Andy, you've indicated. Yes, thanks, uh, Chair. Um, Thanks, thanks for the overview. Um, can I maybe start by asking about the cost of work allowance, where, where that currently sits? Um, I know there was issues in terms of legislation and obviously issues in terms of a taxable element with HMRC. What, what engagement the department of officials and indeed the ministers had with uh, her colleague uh, in DOF and Treasury and HMRC in respect of a workaround in that aspect? Okay. Well, the cost of work allowance, uh, obviously, as you've alluded to, was not introduced, um, mm -hmm. and it was uh, primarily because we needed the primary legislation was in place. Uh, it's included in the welfare reform uh, order, Northern Ireland order, um, but we wouldn't need the supported legislation, which obviously we couldn't bring forward in the absence of the assembly. Uh, and then the other issue was the taxation issue. Um, at the time when we developed the scheme, we, we had. Um, quite a lot of contact with the HMRC uh, to clarify um, exactly why the payments would be taxable and what the, the impact of that would be. Uh, the decision was taken at that point um, that, that such a, a request um, to address that with Treasury, because it would have to be a political request, would obviously have to wait uh, on the return of the Assembly. Uh, that was a decision taken within the Department. Since the, the Assembly has returned the cost of work allowance obviously for this year, uh, it simply would not have been practical with the return of the Assembly to introduce the, per the cost of work allowance for this financial year. Uh, so my understanding that the £35 million that was allocated in the original um, mitigations funding package it was returned to the Department of Finance. Um, our priority, I'll be honest, up till now is the extension of the existing mitigation schemes. <coughs> so while cost of work allowance is an option that would be looked at going forward, uh, it is not something that we have actively briefed Minister on at this moment in time because we are primarily looking at extending the existing schemes. Any new schemes, if we were to introduce a cost of work allowance, it would not be introduced until the new financial year. Okay. Um, and just, just further to that, obviously, um, you've engaged, um, the Minister's engaged extensively with the advice sector and other yes. stakeholders in terms of the, the current extension of mitigations and possibly enhancement of mitigations. In what format do you intend to sort of formalise that? Will we see another uh, working group um, to better advise the policy moving forward? Obviously, no one anticipated the Assembly being in the hiatus that we were in, uh, and we had a lot of um, individuals in receipt of mitigations concerned at yeah. the impending March uh, deadline. You know, we, we, we need to inform ourselves and make sure that situations like that are, are uh, scoped out uh, and the best support is provided. I think it's fair to say that one of our minister's watchwords is co-design, mm -hmm. and I know that uh, she has said on numerous occasions in the, the brief time that re re really she's been in, in post that that's how she wants to progress this. It's too early at this stage to tell you exactly, or even to give you more than just an assurance, mm -hmm. that there will be co-design co and we will be briefing the uh, committee on what, what the plans are once we have those plans. But I would be absolutely certain that co-design and working with 
various sectors who have an in interest in this will be a key par part of it. So we'll be t I would imagine that we are going to be talking to everybody about this and we'll be doing our best to make sure that we get this right. Although at the same time we always have to remember that a significant aspect of this is going to be the funding of it. But we are committed to move, moving ahead with it and as soon as we have concrete proposals the committee will be informed. But I can assure you co-design, co partnership, all of that will be at the heart of it. Okay. Um, and just, just a further one to that, um, common theme throughout this, um, if we look at um, budgets and so forth so on, is underspends and we see money being returned to DOF. Um, what, what actions is the department taking to ensure um, underspends don't occur? And of course, you know, we can't take that in isolation. If underspends occur, whereby individuals are receiving um, the entitlement that they're, they're due, then you know, that's entirely, entirely understandable. Mm -hmm. But what then further work is the department doing to speak to the minister to retain that money um, to tackle poverty, for example? Well, that, again, that is something that we'll be looking at as we move, move ahead. There's been a lot of concern around that kind of area. In the absence of an Assembly or a Minister in the last three years, there really wasn't anything we could do about it, because officials didn't have the power to make that kind yep. of decision. But now that we have Ministers in place, I would say that kind of um, approach will be made to them, and we'll be working on that as we move ahead. And can I just add to that? The Basically, our analysis when the mitigation schemes were originally designed, um, we were moving into a new world. We didn't have anything like this. We didn't have anything to compare it to. So um, while I, there have been significant underspends, and we, we take that criticism, it's incredibly difficult to forecast exactly how many people, for example, would have lost on daily and February assessments. Clearly, we now have three or four years of data, which helps us, certainly for the existing schemes, to hopefully model better uh, going forward and to more accurately predict what the spend would be. If we move into realms, as Anna as on has alluded to, with maybe new mitigation schemes, with or whatever we would term them, as part of the review, then it, you, you're potentially moving into the same realms again. It really depends on what you are looking to bring forward, or what the executive and the assembly agrees to bring forward, uh, and how you model that. But obviously we have experience now uh, of the last few years, which should hopefully allow us to make more accurate forecasts going forward. Yeah, no, and just further that, David, I do appreciate that this was new to, to everyone. Indeed, the claimants on the ground, and, and certainly to articulate, it's not a criticism, uh, but more an understanding um, of moving forward and, and a learning process for us all um, to ultimately make sure that those who require the mitigations receive them, uh, and we in turn tackle poverty uh, and enable people to live a fulfilling and active life. <coughs> yeah. Thanks, sir. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, folks. I think uh, Andrew kind of stole my thunder there. It was going to be, well, the focus here obviously is on the extension of the existing mitigations. We would like to hear more around the proposed strengthening of, of mitigations as well, and whether I appreciate, and as you said, it's too early. Even an indication we have to be mindful of the fact that before long, it'll be too late. Yeah. <laughs> they, they know uh, we are operating in, in a very sort of tight window. Here, I think it's it's very reassuring to hear of the work going on between uh, yourselves and the department and the, the sector, and, and I know we'll get uh, evidence now from from uh, a couple of sessions of evidence from people working in that field as well. And I'm sure they'll echo that good working relationship that that <coughs> you've told so. us told us about. Uh, just then, in, in terms of another question that I had asked the, the Minister on this last year, the figures that you've given are all very useful and it would be even more useful if we could get them uh, provided to us. But when we're talking about figures on the bedroom tax or the social size criteria, <coughs> whatever you, you want to call it, uh, we're, and the extension of those mitigations, like say I'd asked the Minister last week, what about the people who had fallen through the loophole? that she has now pledged to close, and I look forward to be it being closed, but how are we going to drag them back out of it? And were they going to be uh, retrospectively awarded an, an entitlement? In my di the course of my discourse with her last week, she thought I was getting that retrospective award of the mitigation yeah. itself, and I appreciate the difficulty that there might be in that, but where people have accrued huge arrears as a result of not <laughs> having the en en entitlement due to the loophole. I think that's something we really need to look at seriously. And if anything has been done, 
or we, we, we'd like to know about that and any costing sort of been estimated Thank around you. that very small number in the greater yeah. scheme of it's things. It's not a big number. I think that whenever we bring forward our proposals in relation to the regulations, which I'm quite sure the committee will want to scrutinise uh, and look, look at, you'll see what we're planning, what, what we're planning there. Mm -hmm. It's too early at this stage because the, the executive hasn't given us appro approval to move ahead. So I really can't go into oh, detail no, about sure. that. Um, but I will say that if the legislation was to be closing that loop, loophole, yeah. it would be from that date onwards. And I don't think it would be possible for it to be retrospective. So I can say that. But... Um, it's, it's too soon to say much more than that because, as I say, it needs to go to the ex whenever we have proposals written up. And we're working away on that. The, uh, the, the folks back at the ranch are working flat out, I can assure you. And they're doing that along with their colleagues in DSO. Um, and there will be regulations coming forward very soon which will deal with all of that. But they have to go to the executive first before we can progress them. Could I just ask on that when you expect to bring these in front of the committee? Because obviously co-production and co-design doesn't exclude us. We're still included in that. Yes. Um, we also need to be able to scrutinise. Yes. So if the regulations are being written, it would be helpful if we were included in that process. I, know, I understand completely that there is a process to go through and the minister and the executive have their place. But um, in the new way of working... Yes. We would like well, to be involved. We look at that because, as, as I say, we have to give the executive its, its place and it may not be possible. But we will talk to Minister about it and see what we can do. But I can't make any promises, but I will investigate that. Um, part of the role of the committee is not just to scrutinise, but to support the work of yes. the Minister and the Department. Um, and on that basis, it would be very helpful, given the wealth of knowledge around this table that we have of, of um, committee members who work day on daily. Um, with constituents faced with the different welfare reform packages, um, it would be appreciated, um, especially given the fact that, that some of us are attending um, often and hearing, you know, groups coming forward with concerns. We we'll um, certainly take take those those views. Back. Just before you go today, I just wanted to come back to a couple of things that hasn't been picked up so far. Um, the continuation or discontinu discontinuation of the two-child limit. Um, we're aware that the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee and the Work and Pensions yes. Committee in Westminster called on government to scrap this policy. Um, has there been an assessment of the impact here in Northern Ireland or any considerations on that? I think that um, we haven't done an assessment, but I think the Human Rights Commission... Yes, the, uh, the, the Human Rights Commission have, uh, an estimate and our analysts, I would say our analysts have looked at their figures and, uh, and we've spoken to their researchers, so we don't have any great uh, issues with what, so we're, I think it's a fairly reliable uh, estimate. <coughs> they, are, they are estimating the two child limit in universal credit, child tax credit and housing benefit um, would affect about 17,000 households and the cost, if you were to mitigate that, uh, would be £56 million pounds per year. And that's in their report they published a couple of months ago. So, while the department, uh, the department is working in producing its own figures, we are on have looked at those and at an early stage when they were being developed, and uh, we don't have any concerns with them, so I would say they're fairly accurate. Okay, it'll just be the impact that it actually has on those families. I know certainly only just yesterday I was providing food banks to a family hit by the, the benefit cap. I've just said in the in the Human Rights Commission report they have estimated the individual effect per household is about three thousand three hundred pounds mm -hmm. per year. Now, I know that's just a figure, and it's not uh, the impact that has in terms of going to food banks and so forth. Yes. It would be good to see that move forward. If there's any further movement coming forward from um, Westminster on that, um, it's certainly something I think all of us would agree would should be brought in. Just can I come a wee supplement on that? The, the, the estimate of the, the the cost of mitigating. Yes. That would be £56 million pounds a year. That must be a tricky estimate to carry out because it's based on children, children that haven't arrived yet. So yeah. it's, yes. it's, it's, it's only going to go up. Yeah. Yes. Well, I don't know yes. you can say it's £56 possibly, million pounds yeah. a year because it couldn't possibly be the same <laughs> from one year to the no, next. No, I, I, you, it's only going to go up. Uh, I mean, I wasn't involved in the finer detail, but I imagine you're, you're taking average family size and just sort of projecting ahead. We know at what point the policy change came in. This goes back to what my point earlier. It, it becomes increasingly difficult when you're trying to model something that we've never had before uh, and what that looks like. Um, I mean, the Human Rights Commission had some very experienced people who'd done their modelling. So we, we have met with them, um, and our analysts went through their detail, and they thought they were fairly robust. So. 
It's, I think it's probably as good an estimate as you're going to get, but just oh, well, it, 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 it could be significantly higher, it could be significantly lower. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very, very difficult to tell. Chair, can I ask supplementary? Yes, certainly can. So, um, see in terms of the strategy rules that you suspect will come forward pending executive agreement, mm -hmm. so each of these components is going to have separate strategy rules under them? Um, I don't think that, no, we're, we're planning to bring forward, I think David can keep me right, right on this, but three different sets. Okay. There'll be one set of re reg regulations that deal with extension. Okay. Mm -hmm. There'll be another set that do what, in very broad terms, we're calling housekeeping, things that we didn't realise at the time that we need to fix. And the third set are to do with universal credit and simply uh, regularising that position in relation to the mitigations for universal credit because at the time when universal credit came in um, the assembly wasn't sitting therefore we couldn't put through regulations so we're fixing that so there'll be three sets so the reason i'm asking is because if you last we can go back as far yes. as last week at the uc you see us will those considerations be featured into any new strategy rules coming forward well, all we can, those, the statutory rules that we, we're working at at the minute are in relation to extension. They're not in relation to going further or looking at all the additional things that are starting or have been coming forward. They're no, really so only about extension. No, and loopholes possibly. Okay, I appreciate that. So it's really just to extend, mm -hmm. to give you the various yes. to extend. So I appreciate that. But what is it you need to do then to ensure that people aren't waiting at least five weeks? The five week rule is something that is obviously at the fore forefront. I mean, you probably saw the, the TV programme on this, this week about it, and I think it featured a discussion about the, or a, an, a, an example of someone who had been hit by the five-week position. Um, that The five weeks is something that we're going to be look, looking at. Of course, people do have access to the contingency fund, and now that the provisions for contingency fund have been changed and improved, I think people should have more access to it. Um, but, however, it's not ideal, uh, and we are actively looking at what we could perhaps do in the future, but that's part of the next round of uh, consideration. And Chair, just with your indulgence, so the co-design and co-production end of that, are you working with the experts in the sector and even... We will be. And even the people that we all listened to last yes. week, the very compelling lived yes. experience yes, that they have. Yes, in particular in relation to you, you see us, where yeah. we've already had a couple of letters in asking for meetings with Minister on that and she will be meet, meeting them. Um, she already has the details that uh, yeah. UCS gave mm -hmm. us at that se session and has expressed extreme um, uh, wishing to actually meet them and hear those, as you say, those lived experience. Yeah. I think I think that the term is experts through experience and she wants to hear from them and that will be part of how we move ahead. I have absolutely no doubt. Okay, thank you, Chair. I have, Thanks, a, couple, um, I have a couple of other members who have indicated to come in. I'm going to let, let guys continue because this is such an important topic. Robin and then Andy. It's just a very short one, Chair. Could you uh, confirm for me when the applicant goes to meet with Capita for the assessment. When does he, at what point does the examination start and at what point does the examination finish? I don't for know. The assessment? Uh, yeah, unfortunately I'm not sure that either of us can answer that question. No. It's a very operational matter which we aren't involved with, but we will go back and ask and get you an, an answer. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, based it only on some of the reports that I've seen yeah. of the examination. I'm, I'm guessing it's the kind of thing where somebody says that the person walked into the room and they... They turned up. Yeah, or something. Yes, they turned up, yeah. 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 Uh, if I just, I mean, yeah. if I'm going to my doctor... Yes. I sit down in the chair and he asks me the questions. And from the clock starts to tick then. Yeah. Yeah. And at what point... I, I honestly don't know, yeah, but I okay. will find out. Okay, thank, thank you, you, Chair. Andy? Thank you, Chair. Um, in the slides here, I just take note at the, the section on uh, food poverty and the social su supermarkets. I'm not sure how much information you can give us on this, but it obviously would appear from the surface of the report, obviously 37,000 um, tonnes of uh, 
food was redistributed through uh, social su supermarkets. Is there any plan within the department to further extend that program? I know we've got the first year as well, um, given um, how well it operated. If, if there's any process, and, and the chair had mentioned, obviously, on, on a daily basis, and I do see it, um, we're continually seeing individuals having to go to food banks. Um, this is obviously a way to, prob to try and address that also. I think the short answer to your question is that we can't answer it because it's, it's another side of the department. Okay. But again, we will come back and get you an answers to that. That would be captured along with, say, the advice sector funding, so it may be worthwhile yeah. if you get yeah. a briefing on all of that. Yes, yes that appreciate that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just before um, we finish up, a couple more issues. The split payments mm -hmm. um, that were brought in um, doesn't seem to have had an awful lot of uptake on that. Apparently not. Um, so I'm just wondering, um, what is the department going to do to raise awareness of this payment option, and is there reasons why this hasn't, there, why it's not been uptake? There hasn't been an uptake. I think we are aware that there has been a low uptake yeah. because I know that there have been questions asked in the last year about it and we, we noted that there was a low uptake. I don't know that we have any explanation as to why. Um, and I'm not sure I'm not sure what our operational call colleagues are, are planning to do about that. Okay. Um, I'd have to go back and ask. If, if you could, that yep. would be good. Um, and then just finally, um, the payments to landlords in the private rented sector have to be processed manually. So I'm thinking about the department at this stage. That's quite labour intensive. Um, is there any way that that could be automated to help with, with your department and to uh, with the process? Far, again, I'm moving into operational areas, but as yeah. far as I'm aware, the department is working with DWP on a solution to that. Okay. That is the, the last uh, that I heard on that. Um, but again, it would have to be our operational colleagues. Okay. Uh, yes, if there's any we update on it. We can get yeah. more on that. So we, yes. we appreciate the pressure that the department's mm -hmm. under um, and automation's the way forward, yes. Okay. Yeah. I don't see anyone else indicating. Um, thank you very much. Just, can I come oh, up? Oh, just in that last one, Chair, <laughs> and it was around the, the direct payment of, of uh, rent to landlords. Has there been much of an issue around the separation of the, the rates out of Housing benefit? Uh, is that something that's come to your attention much? I'm certainly not aware of any great issue. It's a different it process whereby someone has to there's, there's not apply for assistance yeah. with yeah, I, 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 outside I'm of universal credit. Mm. It's been problematic for landlords and mm -hmm. tenants. Yeah. Obviously, as a result, people getting into. I am aware of the process, but again, it goes back to obviously we're 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 not in the operational side of the department. So I, while I'm aware of the process, I'm personally not aware of any problems. Does not mean that there haven't been. We would have to take that back again, get some okay, information for you. Yes, please. I think that's it so far. Thank you very much, folks. Um, not at all. I'm sure we will see you again very soon. Thank you, well. <laughs> Thank you, Hunt David. Members, we're moving on now to agenda item number six, a briefing by Kevin Higgins and Professor Eileen Everson on welfare reform. The briefing paper is on page 147 of the meeting pack, and I'd like to invite Kevin and Professor Eileen Everson to the table, please. Just about we are still morning. Thank you. I can just about see the clock up there. Uh, thank you very much, both of you, for coming along. Um, can I give you? We're, I'll keep an eye on the time for you. About ten minutes um, to give us your your presentation, and then we'll go to questions from the floor. Thank you very much. If you'd like to make your opening statement. Okay. Well, first of all, can I thank you for the invitation to uh, meet with you? Uh, also, can I say how pleased we are at the speed with which the issue of mitigation is being approached? The last six months have been a time of considerable uncertainty and anxiety. So it is very welcome that it's being dealt with the way it is. And thirdly, perhaps I could just say welcome back. Um, with your agreement, we've uh, submitted a six-page document. Uh, we'll try to summarise the main points as quickly as we can. 
Um, although I should say that I strongly endorse a lot of the points that have already been made, certainly with regard to assessment. Appeals is an issue because of the time taken. Also, I've had some reports of appeal to hearings that were frankly brutal. Yeah. Yeah. We might need to look at those. Strongly support co-design. We do not need another committee of inquiry or anything else. Also, closely interrogate the statistics that you're given. You've heard the figure of, say, 34,000 thrown around. That's not 34,000 people. Sure. That's 34,000 households. So you have to add in the husbands, the wives, the children. We're talking about a much bigger chunk of the population being affected by that. Uh, in terms of overall uh, observations, I think there are four points that I would like to make. Uh, first of all, I think it's very important that we remind ourselves of why we have a mitigation package. This, of course, all goes back to the vast programme of cuts in benefits announced in 2010 uh, by the new government. Uh, this was to take place, a programme to go from 2010 to 2015. Obviously, we all looked at this uh, very closely, and it was clear that the cuts would, take, uh, would come in two waves. In essence, the first set focused on tax credits, on housing benefits in relation to private rented uh, claimants, uh, and various other issues. The big loser there was going to be London. We, we could all see it was big cities, high rents, pressure on housing, and so on. When we looked at the second wave, however, that's when the alarm started to ring uh, in Northern Ireland because it seemed to be like a programme that had designed to be particularly challenging to us with our segregated public sector housing, our appallingly high levels of disabil uh, disability and our larger families. So we have in Northern Ireland this horrible, unique uh, combination of difficulties and for that reason the second wave was clearly going to hit us hardest. So that was a case for mitigation. It wasn't that, oh dear, there's going to be more poverty. It was, dear me, we have by a particular set of circumstances in Northern Ireland and that second wave of cuts will be particularly damaging for us. So that was the rationale for mitigation. It wasn't just that we went into it, UEI trying to help people. We had a very clear agenda. We're now at 2020, uh, so we can say, what do we do? The problem is our circumstances have not changed, as you are all aware. We still have the same combination of difficulties and therefore it has been clear to us all for some time uh, that if we are to avoid a substantial increase in hardship in Northern Ireland, we have to retain the core elements of our mitigation package. That is protection against the bedroom tax, protection for families against the benefit cap. I mean, if we think about the benefit cap, basically the government says to people, you need so much to live on and we're going to give you less. There is no logic in that. Uh, we need to help those who have yet to make the transition from DLA to PIP. Uh, and alongside that, it's very important to retain our bespoke advice sector. Now, there was some discussion about that earlier, uh, but I should say that when we were thinking about this, my view was very clear. We didn't want to give just additional resources to the advice sector. We wanted a structure, mm. a structure with a single phone number so that anyone in Northern Ireland could lift the phone, call that number, they get through to people who are skilled in the welfare reform package um, and then are backed up by advisors. So we have a structure, it's unique. It took a lot of effort to put it uh, together and it would be very foolish, I think, to contemplate dispensing with it or amending it in any way. Uh, that advice sector is now playing a particular role in relation to PIP and universal credit as, and, and, and the help is focused on the most vulnerable. And the fact of the matter is the idea of people with severe mental health problems struggling with PIP, struggling with universal credit. I don't know who designs, well, I do know who designs these systems. They're guys in IT companies. Um, and they have very little knowledge, as far as I can see, of how people actually live. Also, there were weaknesses in the package. It's easy with hindsight to say, well, we should have done this differently, we should have done that differently. Two obvious problems that we've got. Uh, first of all, it's now clear that the discretionary support fund was too tightly drawn. But at that time, we didn't know what was coming down the track at us. Uh, we would, so I think that already there is discussion about that. Alongside that, the Universal Credit Contingency Fund could have been deployed more effectively once we realised the long waits that people were going to have to have before they got benefit. Again, we didn't design a system to cope with that. So those are keeping out what we've got, reforming the discretionary support system, uh, fund, reforming the Universal Credit Contingency Fund would be, I think, the absolute basics. <clears throat> Moving on from that, the third area, which you've already touched on, relates to benefit cuts didn't happen uh, or didn't cease in 2015. This government has relentlessly carried on. Uh, the obvious thing is the benefit <coughs> on benefits that has now endured for four years. Um, so there are a whole raft of measures that have made life 
for people on lower incomes more difficult since 2015. Again, however, applying our set of special circumstances rationale, what's the issue for us? And as you've already identified, it's the two-child policy. Whenever I talk about two-child for policy, I always feel like I'm from sort of communist China or some other authoritarian state telling people how they can live, which I find absolutely disgraceful, and it's quite out of line with British social policy generally. Our particular circumstances relate to services available to women, uh, relate to culture, and also to the law. I think I forgot to put that in our submission. But one of the reasons why the joint... The House of Commons Committee came out so strongly against the application of this provision to Northern Ireland was when we explained to them, aidly elected by Lady Sylvia Herman, that in Northern Ireland we have this peculiar situation where the defence against the two-child po uh, policy is rape. However, in Northern Ireland it is an offence not to report an offence. So women in Northern Ireland are placed in a totally unacceptable position, and we think that of all the things that have happened in the last few years, the strongest cases probably, um, in the light of our rationale, uh, are related to that. And then finally, um, Kevin, I hope, is keeping up and will correct me if I've made any errors of ambition. Um, finally, therefore, we've got to not just keep what we've got, but let's be active, let's be proactive. I've heard enough around the table already this morning to know that you've got ideas you want to move forward. So what, how do we approach the future? I think the first thing is stability. We cannot have this on, off, will we get a programme, when will it end, what will happen to people then again. It has been too stressful. It's also, as I say... Wasteful, because when I think of the effort everybody put into putting the mitigation package together in the first place, well, we did it in six weeks, but I'll tell you, we were going 24-7. Um, then we had all of the work that was done by the civil servants, by people like Anne McCleary, the rush to do the regulations. We cannot do that again. We must have stability, know where we're going. <coughs> no sunset clause. Now, that doesn't mean we just sit and uh, do nothing. But the point we're making is there must be no changes to the new framework without the consent of the Assembly. We cannot have this, we're going to stop this, it's going to arbitrarily, in the Assembly itself, when there is a change, whether it's a cut or an improvement, the Assembly must consent to it. We also, I think, need uh, to think about our strategy uh, more broadly. Uh, to my mind, at this point in time, uh, from the I'm, I should say I'm retired now, so I'm just picking up things, <laughs> by the way. Um, but uh, to my mind, it seems that there are two possible options in terms of a general strategy for, for the future for Northern Ireland. Uh, firstly, recent research, as you are probably hear, recent research indicates that the volume of poverty in Northern Ireland is frankly unacceptable, particularly the volume of child poverty. So one option is to say, right, we're going to tackle that head-on, have a broad front, really go for child poverty, etc. Um, and that's the approach that I would love to endorse. However, I feel that there are two difficulties in relation to it. Uh, first of all, there is cost, and secondly, there is justification. Uh, I have not just been involved in benefits, I've spent a lot of my time working in health. I am very, very aware of the acute pressure uh, this is on the health, uh, I was acting director of the Royal Trust for uh, Belfast Trust for a while, and you walk around the site, and you see the volume of dilapidated buildings that we need to replace. So I'm very aware of that, I'm very aware of what's happening in transport and education. So there is a question of we have to fight our corner, and we have to be mindful of the pressure of, on resources. Alongside that, as I say, with regard to justification, uh, the Treasury may take a close interest in our um, doings and comings and goings. The fact of the matter is that the level of poverty is unacceptably high in a number of regions in the UK. If you look at the Midlands, if you look at the North East, you have to say, how will we justify this? So, the second approach, therefore, to my mind, the, is that we should continue uh, with our justification by reference to our special circumstances, and we have a strategy of mitigation that rests on that, but with an ongoing process of review and improvement. Now, what we can do there, rather than go for the big dramatic things, perhaps, we can make minor additions to benefits. Um, and people talk about cost, and this is new, and what can we do? Actually, Scotland is trying out quite a number of things. So we don't just say, I heard some, a weird figure quoted on one thing, and I thought, well, that can't be right. Let's look at what, this, what that is going to cost in Scotland. Also, if we can sort out the gaps, if we can sort out the delays, if we can do things better, if we can deal with the glitches when they appear and we know about them very quickly, 
So, and also if we can do things differently. So I'm very attracted by this idea of co-design. Let's have an ongoing dialogue between the committee, the minister, the voluntary sector, uh, the advice sector, saying, right, this is going wrong, let's fix it. Because the hardship that is caused to people as they wait and they don't know what's going on, they can't find out what they're entitled to or they get the wrong amount of money, that's what's causing a lot of the difficulty. So uh, those are the general themes I wanted to pursue. I've set out in Appendix 1 uh, various suggestions in relation to my final point, uh, you see there, for example, let's go for the let's look at the clinical judgment approach with regard to the six month rule for terminally ill. Um, <clears throat> Uh, let's uh, look at particularly the assessment procedures uh, in disability. I, I really do think there's a case to be made for in-house delivery by uh, staff who are trained, experienced, and have a degree of empathy. Um, alongside that, let's think of how people talk about poverty and, and people in difficulty in Northern Ireland. Generally, welfare reform is a pejorative term. Uh, imported from the United States, where it refers to stigmatised groups on means-tested benefits, typically the black single parent on AFDC. As the Scots are doing, let's go back to using the term social security and try to convey to that that we're about helping people because anybody can fall into difficulty. Most people are a month's, a month's pay away from destitution. So on that basis, let's go back to social security, convey that social security is about helping anyone who falls into difficulty and doing so with dignity. Thank you. <coughs> come to you now. No problem. Three brief points, and I think Eileen has done a comprehensive analysis there. Um, before coming to the session this morning, I engaged with, with our frontline, you know, the frontline advice services. I can take you all appreciate what you were saying around you know, the work that they do and the support that, that and I think you and I think everybody, all constituency politicians, will see the work that the local independent advice services do for people in terms of helping them with forms right through to appeal representation. And maybe there'll be questions about appeal representation, but I did smile whenever a question was asked, I think by this committee or an assembly member around, you know, um, what's the success rate at appeal tribunals? And the, the, the creative response got to a point um, where it, it gave the implication that there's a 3% <laughs> success rate. Um, I can tell you that I've got the official statistics from the appeal service and they're nowhere near 3%, I can tell you. I mean, you, you'll get a sense of that. I know I'm sure you do the work. But in terms of all outcomes that have a definitive outcome at an appeal, there's a success rate of 55%. And if the person has representation, that rises to 65% and above. Mm -hmm. So the work that the advice sector does, we appreciate the support, we appreciate the funding from the department, um, but I suppose we want to get the clear message out there that that you know, the importance of that work and the value that it has, <coughs> helping people through what is very difficult times with, with welfare reform, but I can talk more about the, the appeals and the questioning. Um, really welcome what the Minister has said around co-design. Um, advice and I, the advice sector, we're up for doing things different, differently or whatever needs to be done to get the help that's required to the people that need it most. That's what we're in, in the business of doing. Um, and I suppose a message I'm getting back from the front line, and, and I know you got presentations from officials previously, um, th there might be some confusion out there as to who is doing what, who's best placed to do what, in terms of the advice sector and also in terms of the advice offering of the department. Um, and I know officials were saying there's going to be you know, a big comms PR campaign for Make the Call. Um, I, I don't deny that we should be making support available to people, but we have to be thinking about this. We have to be trying to join things up. Um, we, we don't go past a day now whenever we hear that resources are scarce, resources are tight, so therefore we don't want to be entering into a situation where there's even the perception of competition or duplication out there. It's just too much work to be done. So in terms of advice and I, we're up for this idea of co-design. Who does what? Who's best placed to do what? Um, and in terms of advice services, what you've got are trusted, quality, free, independent advice services embedded in local communities. So let's, let's make the most of that and within the bigger picture of all of that. The final thing I would say then would be around um, the current mitigations on the 31st of March. Um, hearing the officials there earlier, and, and certainly they're in the mode of this needs to get done to prevent the cliff edge. And certainly my sense of it was, you know, extension, let's at the very least extend what we've got. And I can completely understand that. Um, but I also hear what the Minister is saying around closing loopholes. And so I think we have an opportunity here. It won't take a great amount of time, but we have an opportunity 
to at least list out what are all these loopholes that we get a sense that need to be closed. It's quite straightforward for the bedroom tax. I mean, there's one, um, although various things around that, as you point out as well, or I can retrospective and so on, but there's one big loophole. Actually, it's not straightforward when you start to look at the benefit cap. There are various scenarios where, at the moment, we can't say that everybody who is affected by the benefit cap is mitigated. We cannot say that. And there's at least three reasons why we can't say that there are three types of people where there are three types of loopholes that exist. One is that you have to be in receipt of a specified benefit from the 6th of November 2016. So if for whatever reason you're not on a specified benefit at that date, you won't be able to avail of, of the mitigations. So, I mean, I don't want to, to ex draw this out, but there are a number of other areas as well. Happy to take it in questions. I think take this opportunity. We need to get the, the mitigations extended by the 31st of March. There's no doubt about that. But let's use every effort to close these loopholes that the Minister has highlighted. Thank you very much. Um, whew, right. <laughs> um, Professor Everson, I noted, we've noted that the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee Work and Pensions um, Committee joined a point joint report sorry, into welfare policy in Northern Ireland, um, and your report is acknowledging that mitigation payments cannot go indefinitely. You've mentioned that today about the no sunset clause, um, and that we should take account of the special circumstances of Northern Ireland. Um, I know you have some um, suggestions for consideration for us here. Um, but we need to think about a sustainable system. The last thing that we want to do is to get to the cliff edge again. Um, yep. Have you more suggestions or any suggestions as to how we can in ensure that this would be sustainable? Well, I think we should be able to say that <coughs> the minimum we've got, which is in relation to the bedroom tax, the benefit cap, uh, they'll be very limited, it's, uh, uh, arising from the transfer from DLA to PIP over time and the advice centre. I think those are the absolute bedrock. And we should say that's what we're going to have in place as a settled part of policy in Northern Ireland. Now, that doesn't mean everything continues forever. But it might be that we have a change of government in Westminster and they say, oh, no, we don't want the bedroom tax anymore, at which point, of course, it would fall. So you have to have a process of ongoing review. This bit isn't needed anymore, but something else has happened and we need to look at that. Uh, and go for a quiet approach rather than a big bang with a committee or a working party or something like that. And I've put down things that I thought were important in Appendix A and Appendix 1. Kevin has put down other things, but clearly these are just suggestions. Uh, the committee itself could decide to have a role in this and on an ongoing basis say, right, we're going to work through these different issues, we're going to have discussions with the minister, the minister has discussions with the voluntary sector, and just do it as a working effort together. Okay. Ongoing process of review and discussion. Okay, thank you. Um, you also mentioned the advice sector representatives as having implied consent mm -hmm. would be advantageous. Have you had any discussions with the department on that issue and what obstacles are there for, for taking that forward? Yes, and this is in terms of universal credit. We use implied consent perfectly well across all the legacy benefit systems. Yes. No advisors working on behalf of clients ring up DLA and PIP and, and so on. Works perfectly well across the legacy benefit system. For some reason, the department, and this is the same in DWP as well, do not apply the principle of implied consent when it comes to advisors ringing up on behalf of universal credit claimants. Um, we think there's a flaw in that. That has been challenged, and I think the Information Commissioner's Office has come out to say, in their view, there's no good reason why uh, implied consent cannot be used in terms of universal credit. So, okay. so we think there's a there's no good reason why that can't happen. In terms of our engagement with the department, Advice and I, we have engaged with the department and we were in the midst of trying to get a pilot off the ground where our advisors could work with the universal credit staff using implied consent. Now, that hasn't got off the ground yet and perhaps it'll be overtaken by events. You know, perhaps the committee, the minister, will, will, will take a view on all of this as well uh, and take advice on it. Um, but we think it's so important. Why fund the advice sector? To a substantial amount of money to help vulnerable people and then tie at least one hand behind her backs. Okay. Um, so you have Carol, Carol has indicated. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you both for your presentation. Um, mm -hmm. I mean just putting the records like our, our party would prefer universal credit to be scrapped, but mm -hmm. you know it should I mean that's that's just the fact of the matter and I just totally accept the point that you're making, Professor Epson, around welfare reform. I mean, what we're dealing with here is Tory austerity, and it's having the worst impacts on people 
who are most vulnerable, and that's poor straight across. And particularly here, coming out of political conflict, it's going to take us a very long time, particularly when there's been no uh, protections around that, or even you know bespoke investments for that. But you know the whole um, issue of benefits. It, I just think it needs a bespoke approach. So, I mean, the mitigations were was certainly part of that. Kelly's asked a question, Kevin, and you've partially responded around um, the enablement of the advice sector, and we'd look forward to hearing what the information commissioner has said because while we accept for some time the GDPR issues, but if it's not applied the straight straight way across the board. And the other aspect of it is, even as elected representatives, we've had this, we've had this, and it's very, very frustrating. Um, even when you have consent and written consent from clients or their advocates, you're still having to go through these loopholes. So the sooner that's closed, the better. And I don't understand that it just applies to one section of benefits. Um, I just feel, as a, an elected representative, it's probably one of the most undemocratic things I've had to deal with. Um, but I think we're all on the same page if we can get that sorted well and good. So you mentioned um, greater discretionary or greater um, awareness and access to the discretionary support scheme, and particularly around the universal credit cons con the, the CC or UCCF model. How is that going to, you know, given the short time that we have between getting? The mitigations continued and trying to close the loopholes for me. And it's and, and again you made the point about the sunset clause, but how can we do this in a short is it going to take a whole big pile of work? And it's not to undermine what Anne had said previously, because you have experience of working with the department and the work ethic and what they'll do, but I'm still nervous about these loopholes because mm -hmm. what happens is we will get the mitigations, for example, extended. But if those loopholes aren't closed in relation to the benefit cap and the bedroom tax, it'll take some time for them for us to come back to them to be closed. Mm -hmm. So if can, in your opinion, can this be done <coughs> at the same time as the continuation of the mitigations? <coughs> <coughs> My understanding is that the department is already looking at the discretionary okay. support fund, um, and I don't know how much progress they've made. But I would have, I would have thought if, if we say to them, look, where is the big problem in universal credit? Yeah. The big problem in universal credit is the delay before yeah. people get their first payment. Yeah. Uh, there are all sorts of other difficulties, but that's the big one. And I would be saying, right, explain, or devise a model for us whereby we channel support for people in that situation through the discretionary support, support fund, or maybe we should just amalgamate the two things. Mm. <clears throat> and what we can do is prioritise as well. So there's the, there's the support that people get at the moment, and, and I think if, if it gets to the point where we're really facing the cliff edge, then we have to ensure that, that those payments continue to people. Mm -hmm. um, discretionary support seems to be slightly different in that it will continue after the 31st yeah. of March. Mm -hmm. So we have... We have a window of our, we've survived with it for this long. We could survive for say another quarter, another three yeah. months, let's say, and take a bit more time. And then let's let's see what the department's internal review of discretionary support has told us. Um, things like you know the the, the income threshold. It's it's too harsh. It, it's it's yeah. depriving people of access to the support they need. Things like you know only uh, limiting help to one grant and, and one loan throughout a, a rolling 12 months uh, period. So there's, there's things like that that are fairly obvious. That, um, but if it can't be done now, prioritise the other, but do it in short order after the 31st of March. Um, and then you get into the realms then of operational issues. So how do you access discretionary support? How do you access the contingency fund? You have to ring that phone number. It can be very difficult at times to get through to that number. When you get to, do get through. It can be an awfully long phone call for people. So how can we try and improve the operational process of that so that we get the money to the people that need it? Um, and again, that could be part of it. There could be a parallel review on the operational issues that need to be addressed as well. And then the other aspect of it is, is the, the, I mean, people don't even realise or didn't realise that they were being sanctioned and why they were being sanctioned. Um, and I think even, like, I'm trying to use... The period that we we'll have is an opportunity. I mean, there one of the that's another um, obvious loophole that 
you know, needs to be closed, particularly, you know, if we even look at, for example, and what's nothing to do with yourselves, but the whole steps of success debacle, mm -hmm. um, particularly people who have been in the system, looked after mental health, you know, there are issues that are particularly trying to help another layer of people who need that additional help. So what role does the advice, independent advice sector, or what role, enhanced role could you have in relation to help helping can, can those? Can I just say that there is some research that hasn't been published yet, which I had sight of last week, which actually says, suggests that actually sanctions are less of an issue in okay. Northern Ireland uh, than elsewhere in the UK. And part of that is because claimants are being provided with phone numbers for uh, where they can get advice and support to challenge the sanction. Okay. And certainly we did have a big emphasis on this in the report where we were making it very clear yeah. that the sanction should not be imposed uh, without the uh, member of staff, uh, decision maker, uh, having uh, really uh, made an effort to establish that there were good grounds for that. So we have got safeguards in place in Northern Ireland, uh, but certainly I think uh, I do worry that the information that right, you're being sanctioned, the reason for this is, can you give me a, a good reason for why the sanction shouldn't be applied and all right, if we still can't come to an agreement over this, here's the phone number where you get support. That's what we envisaged would happen, but I mean, clearly I'm not in the field and Kevin, you might have I, I, knowledge of that. Yeah, I think we're now in a timely place. Things have changed, as yeah. we know, significantly over this last few weeks or whatever in terms of oversight and we have a minister in place and so on. Um, sanctions is a big issue. It's depriving people of money to survive and put yeah. food on the table and so on. And it was, we did major on it in the, in the mitigations report. And actually the department did good work after that report in terms of, as Eileen says, putting in referral arrangements mm -hmm. and so on. And so we got off to a good start. Is that, is that still happening to the extent that it should be now? I think it's well worth refreshing that. Uh, putting it in, in the minds of staff that are minded to sanction someone all right now. Uh, we have to explore a good cause, a good reason. Um, perhaps before we do anything, we'll make sure that that person has independent advice. The other thing I want to get the opportunity to say, and you, you raise the issue of mental health, is around the safeguarding responsibilities of the department in terms of benefit claimants. So. Um, if the department is minded to sanction someone, deprive them of income, you know, what safeguarding arrangements, measures should they be triggering and putting in place? And again, that takes me back to the point I was saying earlier around the advice and support services that are available within the department, and those being maybe deployed uh, in a way that would be most effective. Mm. So before actually pushing a button and sanctioning someone, maybe then you would deploy someone from Make the Call or the Advice Service to go out and visit that mm -hmm. family or vulnerable person with mental health problems, so uh, adhering to the responsibilities around safeguarding. So repeat the message, the advice sector's up for that and up for being involved in referral mechanisms and signposting and so on, but uh, we can do the stuff that's out in the community. The department know the people that they're going to sanction, well they know the people that they're going to close their universal credit case, those are people maybe that are sitting in their homes and have made their application digitally in the house, the advice sector maybe don't, aren't aware of those people, yeah. but the department are aware of them because they're going to maybe potentially inappropriately close their UC case. Again, with safeguarding, before closing, get a member of staff out to home visit that potentially vulnerable person or with children in the household. So again, there's a range of things we can do there. Yeah, can, can I just say in addition to that, that uh, when we last appeared before this committee, when it was a different committee and all the rest of it, and we were explaining what mitigation would involve, we came to an agreement that the committee would have an ongoing review role. And I actually prepared a checklist so that the committee could say, right, uh, having the uh, relevant offices in front of it, how far have we got on this point? You know, on that point. So we had a checklist that the committee would, where the committee would follow through with the department what action was being taken and if things weren't happening, why weren't they happening? And I certainly think that would be very helpful because we've been stuck, as you all know, <laughs> in this limbo <coughs> the last three years when we've seen things happening and we thought, well, we haven't got anybody to, anywhere to go on this. And if we take, for example, the cost of working allowance, when I ceased involvement in it, my last conversation with the then uh, chief executive of the Social Security Agency was that things were going ahead okay. 
So I have no no concerns. And then I received a very long email from the Permanent Secretary uh, subsequently outlining the details. I haven't got a minister to go to or a committee to go to to say we've run into these problems. Okay, if that doesn't work, the intention was to do something with the low paid workers, can we think of something else? So there are all sorts of ways in which the absence of a minister and the absence of a committee uh, has really made it extremely difficult for us to progress anything. Okay, Robin, you've indicated. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and welcome the uh, members uh, to, to the committee. What I could I just raise? Uh, I did raise with the officials uh, the assessment process, and particularly around the mental health issues. I'd be interested to hear your comments uh, around that. In, in terms of the uh, PIP um, and the descriptors uh, within PIP, and I find uh, a great deal of difficulty with uh, some of the descriptors. Um, and I fa find that they change from DLA having three levels of, of support to PIP having only the two levels of support. Um, I, I find it difficult to uh, understand uh, that area. And there's one area which is uh, seems to be uh, fairly well neglected in terms of support, and that's in the ESA area. In the ESA area, and particularly around the movement of a, an applicant from uh, into the support group, where, and, and especially I think if someone has got uh, mental health issues, moving from into a support group, and the implications for that person of not being in the support group um, is torturous. Uh, in my opinion, on a day-to-day, week-to-week, month-to-month basis. So I'd be keen to hear what your thinking is uh, around those, those issues. I think the difficulty is that we are stuck with PIP and we are stuck with the descriptors. And it's very difficult to see how Northern Ireland could move away significantly uh, from that structure and therefore all we can do is make sure that people have the best advice. I mean, I always say to people, don't try and fight the system on your own. Always, uh, refer, I always refer them to Kevin, to the, to the Bespoke Advice Service, because from the outset you need skilled help to get through PIP and to get through universal credit. Uh, and it is very difficult to see how we can, how we can amend that. It's also I think, important that we, we sort of continually challenge these systems. We don't just sit there and say, oh, PIP's a good idea. Well, it wasn't. Uh, universal credit's a good idea. It wasn't. I mean, the, the rationale for universal credit was utterly specious. And we should remember that the argument was, oh, all these people are trapped on benefit, and if they have universal credit, uh, they're going to work. Well, actually, they weren't trapped on benefit. Even in Northern Ireland, 80% of people on JSA went back to work within the first uh, year, and often much more quickly. So the, the rationale for universal credit made no sense. And yet we, we hear it continually being trotted out by the Department of Work and Pensions. And then they say more people are going to work. Actually, the only piece of research I've, I've seen on this suggests that people on universal credit are slightly more likely to go into work uh, by six months uh, after six months on benefit than people on JSA. Uh, in practice, I mean, we don't know where they go. We don't know whether they're, they might not be going into work. They might be just dropping out because they can't take another minute of it. Uh, because of the uh, excessive harassment that uh, claimants are subjected to um, in, in Britain, as has been shown in the documentary currently running uh, on TV. So I think we have to challenge PIP, and we have representatives in the House of Commons to do that. We have to challenge universal credit. Even if you could say we've got a proportion of people and you know we can't seem to get them into work, you don't turn the whole system upside down because of that. You don't create a system that includes people with severe mental health disabilities uh, and, and, and severe physical disabilities when the exercise is to get these people into work. What they do in Scandinavia is say, right, we'll put special programmes in place uh, dealing with um, difficulties that people may have with regard to reading, writing or whatever. So there was no need for universal credit in the first place and I think we have to remember that. <coughs> the one thing, a few things I would add to that, in terms of ESA and the support group, um, I think for, in terms of the advice sector, on the whole we see that as a fairly steady state. So there's something like 85, 90% of ESA claimants would be in the support group. Now, obviously, they'll go through reassessment and some maybe will fall into the RAG group and, and the implications of all of that and so on. But on the whole, reasonably steady. <coughs> the concern that that gives us, though, is that the numbers are high. It's like 85, maybe 90,000 claimants that would be ESA. I'll start to be corrected, but it's off that order, who are severely disabled. They're in the support group. What about universal credit, the move to universal credit? How, in particular, are that big group of people 
going to be moved on to UC in terms of the digital and claiming it and the waiting for money, the conditionality around all of that. I mean, you will know yourselves that there are some people through natural migration move from ESA onto universal credit. The medical uh, position that they were in on ESA should carry across onto UC, but often we see that it doesn't, and it becomes a piece of work to try and get that award sorted out for the person. So that, that group of people on ESA steady enough at the moment, but that's, I think, where we would see the most concern in terms of looking ahead and, and the issues around moving to UC. Um, two other brief points I would add, just in terms of that. PIP, um, people with mental health problems, I mean, you're right. We would, we would hope if we, could, if, we, if we were wanting to construct a system that wants to give the decision maker the best possible chance to get the decision right, you would have the capita staff that are doing that expert in the field that they're examining that person in. And we know a lot of the time that the person on, on PIP will have a mental health problem of one, of one extent or another, but the person that's carrying out that examination, as you said earlier, you know, doesn't have the expertise in that area. So they're going to potentially be traumatising that person, going out the door and then leaving that person to pick up the pieces with maybe a report that isn't good enough and it means the double blow then becomes they don't get the benefits that they're entitled to. So there's issues around all of that. As you know, Minister has announced the PIP review that will take place over the coming months. Due to a report, I think, in June, I mean, we'll, we'll be contributing to that and flagging that. There's already been one review, though, and I suppose the process has... The, the department, to be fair to them, have made some changes, but effectively it's the same process. It's, and when we look at decisions of the PIP decision-maker, very often it says the decision was based on the assessment report. So effectively it's based on that report of that capita official or, or, or person who isn't expert in that field or whatever. So the flaw then runs through, and to be fair to the decision maker, they make the decision based on the report, so little else they can do there. <coughs> Although that takes us to the issue of additional medical evidence, um, we can try and challenge that if we can get access to that. But that's becoming increasingly difficult, yeah. as you know as well. Um, there are cost implications. Uh, GP surgery are very busy, so maybe won't provide that and so on. So additional medical evidence can be important. Um, and then it's just the fatigue of the whole process. If, if it isn't the right PIP decision or you're turned down, you have to try and work your way through the mandatory reconsideration. If that doesn't go for you, and very often it won't, I think 80% of the time, more or less, it won't, you then have to try and find it within you with your mental health problems and so on to try and keep going. Um, and we know the stats from the department are there's a 22% disallowance rate in terms of the working age people move from DLA to PIP. So, uh, and in terms of earlier officials were saying, well, we couldn't be expected to know, you know, what the... It's funny that the Treasury document back in 2010 said that introducing PIP will introduce a saving of 20% by caseload and 20% by expenditure. So it's not far off in terms of that. My final comment is around complaints. Um, I know officials would say... Look at the figures for complaints, very low in terms of capita, very low in terms of universal credit. Um, my only point on that is I would say to the staff and advisors, if you see something that hasn't gone the way it should have, please do complain. Um, but it becomes a very confusing issue because an official has told you at the last evidence session they're introducing these informal resolution things around complaints. So to my mind, I always like the structure of you have a tier one, a tier two, and eventually it ends up in this the table of a senior official within the department. Um, to my mind, it, it's, it's a risky business to be introducing informal, let's resolve these things, because the learning from that maybe isn't, isn't being fed across and so improving the things that need to be improved. Yeah, could I just come in right, with two, two very quick points? Uh, first of all, um, I was chair of the Standards Committee for Northern Ireland for many years, and we tried and we tried <coughs> and we tried to sort out why appeals in Northern Ireland take so much longer than across the water. And it was to do with the volume of evidence that they required, the medical records that they required. They always said, oh, the claimant consents. Well, of course you do if you need the money. Uh, I really do think we could try to be a bit more um, expeditious, expeditious in all of that. The other thing is, if you look at PIP and if you look at universal credit, actually, to, to broaden the discussion, across the world, IT systems are making a big effort to get involved in the delivery of social provision. Um, and they say to governments, well, you'll be able to cut this amount of staff and you'll be able to cut this amount of expenditure. And then it all goes horribly wrong, as we see with both Universal Credit and PIP. So it is very important, whenever you see the latest proposal to digitalise something, say, hang on, 
Is this going to work? Has it been tested? I mean, we were told it was, but it was <clears> <throat> tested, and they tested it, they found the problems, and they carried on. So it is very important to be mindful of that trend and to challenge that trend, because, frankly, as we heard in the evidence given to the Joint Committee from the House of Commons, from the claimants, that there is no substitute for having somebody in the local office who can help with the computer, with the files, with the portals, with all these other things that they're supposed to be grappling with. We need people on the ground to provide support both in the advice sector and within the service itself. Robin, you want to... Uh, just a short one to Kevin. In terms of the ESA and the two-person panel on the ESA as opposed to the three-person panel on PIP, any comments around that? I suppose we try and come at these things from you know, from the person, from the claimant, um, and I suppose it's around trying to get the results. So if someone is proceeding to an appeal, I think what our advisors and reps, we, we just try and go there and represent the person to the best of our ability. So I'm thinking um, more about in terms of the, the, the knowledge on the other side of the table from the applicant in terms of <coughs> only uh, a legal doctor as opposed to someone who's understanding uh, the... Um, Disability issues. Yeah, I can I can see what you're saying. Um, although I think I would have to say, if you look at the success rate at tribunal and 55% rising steeply, if you've got a representative, I mean I have to I have to give credit to the appeal service and to the panels. Um, I know they can be a, a I, difficult. I've already beginning attributing tribute to you the did, appeal you did, service. You did. You did. And and as well. So I, I think on balance, I mean, yes, if you have somebody you know who knowledge of and, and of that disability and so on that the person is appearing with, certainly then there should be a higher level of understanding. But but on the whole, you know, we would feel that um, <coughs> albeit there are some where it can be a <coughs> you know a very difficult experience for the claimant and for those types of chairs and those types of panels perhaps you know <clears throat> a bit more training to try and make it you know not as you know harrowing experience for the appellant to appear because it is actually it's their livelihood you're talking about it you know it's money that they really <coughs> desperately need but on the whole you know uh, success rates would say that you know people if they can get their case to an appeal tribunal they stand a good chance of getting a good result thank you, Chair. Thank you. mark you had indicated Oh, uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Aidan and, and Kevin, for coming uh, along today and giving us that accurate but probably uh, censored <laughs> overview of uh, universal credit. I have to put on record, I suppose, as well, my party's opposition uh, to universal credit. We'd love to see it scrapped. That's why we voted against introducing it in the first place. Uh, and the given the complexity, and protections. The, given the complexity, no, the budget that the, the, no, the protections, and the protections for people who are vulnerable, no, the, and the, the, the budget, drugs, and special educational needs, and health. Folks, we'll head that. Because it's look, that's all worked out so great. Uh, the the complexity of of so many of the cases, and Kevin touched on it, I suppose, when he was he, he was looking at. It, it, the need to strengthen mitigations because just extending the current ones around the benefit cap, for example, there are, are so many different wee loopholes. And the, I, I think of some of the convoluted cases that come into our own constituency offices, and every week you're learning something new or something new wrong uh, with the system. But that would underline to me the importance of ensuring maximum flexibility in any mitigations uh, package going forward, the, the ability to respond to these <laughs> these new uh, problems as they come to light. Because, I mean, some of the cases are like an 11-plus question almost. There's so many different uh, components that, that, that need uh, considered. So I was wondering uh, your view on that. It's difficult to do that in legislation, though, but I think um, it's important to maximise, I suppose, the discretionary aspect of things. And you touched, Eileen, then, on the danger of over digitalization I think. And uh, if you'd have been watching the committee last week, you wouldn't even have heard me make those same points because the technology wasn't working. <laughs> but, but, but that was around the proposal, I think, to digitalise further in the discretionary support aspect of things where you can least afford to, uh, would be my opinion, because you, you do need that element of, of discretion where the computer says no, but the, the, the more computers we have, I think that the more likely <laughs> that they all are to, to, to say no. Uh, I'm delighted to hear, I suppose, in terms of the co-design, I think that's uh, vitally important, but as well as co-design, there's also co-copy and paste 
because it's not a case of reinventing the wheel if we do look at what is happening in other jurisdictions. And I'm, I'm keen to hear maybe a wee bit more about that. You've pointed to Scotland uh, a, a, as a, a beacon, I suppose. I'd be keen to he hear a, a wee bit more of your, your views on, on, on what we could be kind of taking over from there. Well, I mean, uh, I think I'm not sure they've got to the stage of delivering it. But certainly, I think they have the uh, pro proposal for the baby grant. Yeah, that's one. And um, I mean, everybody would go into a tis was here because they say, oh, it'll cost so much. I mean, with, if they introduce it, we can say it's clearly a measure to promote child welfare. And we do have to remember that when the cuts were made, incredibly, um, they, they, they were made, the first cut actually fell on the health in pregnancy grant. And the health in pregnancy grant hit, was a measure to promote maternal and child welfare. Yeah. And it was, it was stunning that that was the first one they cut. So clearly, something that goes towards restoring that. Uh, would be extremely helpful. Uh, we can get you, we can get the information from Scotland. You know, right? Uh, how much is it going to cost there? And then we'll, it'll cost about a third of what they spend uh, over here, given the difference in the population. Uh, they talk about clinical judgment as opposed to the sort of very harsh terminally ill provisions that we have. Again, how much? I think did you say somebody said that would cost three hundred million? I, I can't believe that. I mean, that's just silly because um, that would mean that Scotland was spending a billion which I find difficult to believe. So you be very careful with the figures that you get. Uh, again, therefore, we can say, right, let's find out from Scotland how does this work and how much is it going to cost. So I think there are things like that that we can do along the way to try to improve things. Um, and with regard to um, d digitalisation and so on, uh, it is very important that you say, right, if we're going to lose staff, what is it those staff did? Because a lot of the time, you know, we talk about, say, health uh, in, in health service, and, uh, and they're all pen pushers and all this, that and the other. I never saw anybody in the health service that we didn't need. So we have to challenge that kind of mythology as well. And I suppose just to, to add to some of the things, I mean, <coughs> very often in the advice sector, as you know, we're, we're dealing with there's very little cloth available, so we have to try and, and do what we can and maximise and stretch and, and, and so on. So... <coughs> Very often we're in the business of well, <coughs> we've got the, we have what we have. How can we how can we try and make it more effective and so on? And uh, we have to try and think about universal credit because like it or loathe that that's where all the work and age means tested benefits is, is going to sit uh, whenever all this settles down. And um, so things like potential inappropriate case closures when somebody is trying to struggle to make their initial UC application, um, we have to try and do something about that and, and understand. The extent that it's happening, why is it happening? Can we do no more to to support people through that process? Um, I mean, we all know around departmental planning and so on. And through all the years, we were able to plan really carefully what all the new legacy applications were going to be. So, income support, AS, JSA, housing benefit tax credits. And the people that delivered them were able to estimate to a quite an accurate degree what the number of new claims were for all of that. And as far as I understand it, the data is now showing that uh, those projections, when you then bring in universal credit, they're not being replicated. So where are those people that were routinely making all these new claims and being having decisions and getting the, the money paid and the benefit paid, where are they now within universal credit? Because as I understand it, the uptake has dropped. Um, so it's around support in order to get the application made. We all know about the problems with Verify, the ID, online ID verification system. It's a failing system. People aren't, and that's driving then people into the front offices to verify their identity. We need to tidy all of that up. Responding to journal entries, something as simple as that, that if somebody is trying to use the digital system and they do post something on their journal, they may not get a timely response, and then that leads to frustration with all of that. It can lead to an overpayment. So, for example, a claimant notifies the department about something, they continue to get an incorrect payment, then eventually the department does something about it. It's clearly a departmental error, clearly an official error, but what do they do? They recover that overpayment. Yeah. That is vastly different from what happens in the legacy benefit system. Yeah. If there's a departmental error, the department do not recover. And again, um, I point to what Steve Crabb said in the, in the Commons there a few weeks ago about UC. He said, you need to go and make the case with Treasury. And I felt it was sad and pathetic that the work and pensions minister who's responsible for universal credit said, he almost put out a plea, I have some brilliant ideas about UC, he said, but could somebody please help me make the case with Treasury? And to me there was something soul-destroying about that, that you have a minister whose responsibility <coughs> is this and to improve this, and yet 
and yet he's just sitting helpless there because um, he can't do the things that they would like to do. Um, and there's one thing I would do, it would be that they should have that legacy approach to writing off overpayments where it's absolutely no fault and clearly no fault of the claimant. Um, and then a few old claiming UC by phone have been banging on about it for ages. It is possible to claim UC by phone, um, but that's if the person can find the UC service centre number in order to make that claim. And believe me, it's not that widely available. We talked about implied consent. Passporting families with children that are claiming UC, we have to, they have to wait until that UC gets into payment before they can get all the passporting benefits. And the big one is free school meals. So if we're looking about speeding up the payment of UC, we have to then speed up all the vital passporting arrangements that go along with that as well. Um, my final point will be around rates. And I noted the point made earlier that we don't see a really huge problem with rates. In the advice sector, we see a huge yeah. problem with rates. People are either choosing not to claim UC, even though there's a rates entitlement there for them because they don't want to have anything to do with universal credit or people that do claim it, but they don't make the separate application for rates. So we see rates as a problem. And in fact, Advice and I, we made a submission to the business rates consultation just to highlight the issues that are arising with the domestic rates issue. And I can, I can share that with the committee if you want to see it. Yeah, I think with universal credit, we have to remember that it's rather like the 1834 Paul of Amendment Act. And that was designed to deter people from seeking assistance. When I read the legislation, the first half was who can't get it, and the second half was about well, who'll be thrown off benefit for, for such and such a reason. Thank you. Thank you. Emma, you've indicated. Thanks, uh, Chair, and um, thank you both for your presentation. Um, I just, it's been touched on, I suppose, the, the theme uh, across the, the room is that universal credit as a system is humiliating and degrading, and we all have evidence of that and experience within our own um, constituency offices and I know that um, I've I've heard different anecdotes about you know capita staff having targets and and things like that and out of my own view on that when you especially when you hear like a quarter of the budget for discretionary support and the jump the hoops that people have to jump through to get access to that help and then the, the number of appeals that are successful suggests and again that people have to jump through hoops and prove that they are deserving of something which they need to help them live. I just wondered about um, in terms of the staff because I'm, I'm conscious that within the Jobs and Benefits Office and within the, the appeals service and the people who are for capita, obviously these are human beings as well and they're dealing with difficult situations and oft times maybe aren't um, sort of getting the best support or help and I'm just wondering if from your side you're you're getting experience of that of, of people going off on sick and leaving due to stress and well I, I think that whenever you outsource something mm -hmm. you run a number of risks so if you take the social security agency you had in there a body of staff and I used to go around, go, go to local offices and meet them regularly and they knew their staff and they were very concerned. I mean, I always quote this anecdote that there was to be a change with regard to, um, you know, the number of children women could have before they sort of, the age of children and being required to work. And I was saying, right, now how are our own parents going to know about that? And, and the last who was responsible said, well, I phoned them all. Now, that kind of concern, I think, has been drained out of the system. Um, alongside that, with regard to capita, they, they have no investment in the public service. They have no idea of the ethos of public service. Um, very often, I suspect they won't be on terribly good wages. They're not. Part, we, we need people who are part of the service, who are employed on proper terms and conditions, and have a, a chance of progression and, and development. Then you will get, I think, a higher level of service delivered. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't disagree with you in terms of like raise the concerns about capita, but I just think in the meantime, those people are still doing the yeah. job and trying to make a living, and I'm just. I'm, I'm wondering if you have evidence of that, or, or are getting mm. that feedback from those people that they're that they're experiencing the same sort of stress that <coughs> you would assume that they are. <coughs> the, the experience of. Well, I haven't done any direct experience, but I, I think it's just listening to claimants and listening to the staff in the department, or as well as the agency. And you make a fair point. I mean, nobody goes into their job to try and do a bad job or whatever, and that's, that's equally the same in the advice sector. I'm not saying we're perfect, same in the department as well. Um, 
But I suppose, and I was listening to some previous evidence, and I suppose if there's things like a recruitment freeze or whatever, and if the department are starting to, you know, take on agency staff to try and, and meet demands and so on, I mean, to me, you know, there could well be issues there around, well, will the correct advice be given to people? Will there be misleading advice? Some, you know, evidence, at least early on with UC and maybe still around people being inappropriately advised to claim UC and move from their legacy, you know, when they didn't need to do it. So, um, but, uh, yeah, people don't purposely go out to do that, but you have to have the systems in place not to support staff to provide the best possible service. Um, and again, comes back maybe to the co-design as well or whatever, if the advice sector can have a role in, in trying to help and ensure the best possible advice gets out there, we're up for that. I mean, one of the things I noticed in the local offices was that they had arrangements whereby they all got together at, say, 10 o'clock in the morning and shared their experiences, and then they discussed the legislation, and so they sort of were working together to try and get it right. Capita and companies like that don't work on that basis, uh, and that's the difficulty. And you have to allow, you know, it takes a number of years, certainly in benefits, to sort of get together a body of knowledge that means, oh, right, that's such and such, and I'd better go and talk to another decision maker about that and so on. So they have systems, and Capita is very, very different. And you so said there isn't the trade, you cannot give people uh, the training they require to just put them in front of claimants who've got very complex circumstances. And it's not just PIP. I mean, we had capita, problems with capita with um, tax credits, mm -hmm. uh, and that was a mess as well. Uh, there is this frenzy to outsource, and we're told it saves money, but it doesn't. You, you tend not to get the same quality of service, whether we like it or not. Uh, and uh, also, uh, you have all sorts of repercussions for people's lives. And that's not to fun. say that they aren't decent people. Contemporary. Because they haven't the background, they haven't the experience, they haven't the culture. Thank you. Um, just what, just finally, um, before we finish up with yourselves, and thank you very much, um, I just wanted to tease out something, Kevin, um, you had mentioned earlier. Make the call. Uh, well, well, as you say, there was a, a, some sort of a communications and marketing um, push that will be happening on that. Not a bad thing, because we need people to know about that. But I'm just wondering, as far as the advice sector funding is concerned, is that on a grant basis or a contract basis? Because obviously the department knows what Make the Call can do and what it doesn't do, I would be expecting they would have planned to grant aid or contract with yourselves to deliver the rest. Um, I'm just wondering, I'm, I'm quite keen not to have duplication and having worked in an umbrella body before, um, it's very it can be done quite quickly and it gets very confusing to the public. So I just want to tease out, is it a contract or a grant? And what are the terms and conditions laid down? It's, it, <coughs> to go a little bit into the background or whatever, I mean, if we go back a number of years, I suppose the, what was happening were benefit uptake initiatives uh, within the Department for Social Development, as was. And then there would have been procurement arrangements with the independent advice sector, letters going out to you know, 20, 30,000 uh, households across Northern Ireland based on what the systems would have shown as potential you know, entitlement to benefits with that. So people are sitting at home with no intention of claiming extra money. They get the letter through the door, invited to ring the advice sector. The advice sector does the benefit checks and so on, helps with the forms, and then generates that. And it was really, really successful. That continued up until about 2015, 2016, and then that stopped. And I suppose it was from that time then that, that make the call. It, it sort of, I suppose you could say, it went in house, yeah. and, and make the call tended to become, you know, a little more, you know, obvious out there in terms of advertising and so on. Um, I have to, as I said, whenever I was preparing for this and engaging with the front line, I did get a lot of feedback from the front line around. You know, as you say, potential confusion potentially out there. Do I go to the independent advice sector? Do I go to you know, a service of the department? Um, and to me, all I want is that taking uh, the idea and this idea of co-design and ministers highlighted, I think it is time now that we sit down and talk about, about who does what, as I said earlier. I mean, there are things you're right. There are things that make the call can't do. So say, for example... Yeah they help someone with an application, say that application's turned down or it's only partially awarded, Make the Call can't challenge the department on that. It can't. And ultimately, if that ends up at a tribunal, the department can't send along a presenting officer and send along a Make the Call member of staff. It, it just doesn't stack up. So to my mind, there's external stuff, I think, with advice agencies embedded in communities, with the links around other organisations and trusted within the community, I think we're, we're well placed to do that. 
I equally think there's a need for those services of the department, and maybe the conversation is around what is it best that we do, what is it best that they can do, and I'll really give some examples where the department may be aware of someone str struggling within the system, and then why can't that service be deployed to help those people with those struggles? Chair, can I just ask Barry one yes. very quick supplementary? So they've just made the argument that the department should give people access to contingency fund when they're making an application for universal credit. That should be done at the same time. Operationally, yes. these are the, absolutely. I mean, yeah. if we're putting okay. people first, that's, that's yeah. yeah. Thank you. Unless we hear that there is going to be a dramatic improvement with regard to this payment, if they bring it down to say two weeks, then we can think about that. But five weeks is ridiculous. No, at least. And it's not five. It's five, six, seven. Yeah, exactly. Universal catastrophe. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you. See anyone else indicating? Um, very appreciated. Um, thank you. Thank you for your time. Committee, we're moving on now to agenda item number seven, which is a briefing by the Cliff Edge Coalition on Welfare Reform. The briefing paper is at page 154 of the meeting pack. There's also individual correspondence from the British Association of Social Workers on page 73, which we'll find useful. Um, so I'd like to invite to the table Kate McCauley from Housing Rights, Ursula O'Hare from the Law Centre NI, Andy Clenahan from VASW NI, and Siobhan Harding from the Women's Support Network. Could I just check with you before we get started? Are each of you going to speak, or is there one person going to speak on behalf I'm, of... I'm going to open, Chair. Okay. And, and then I'm going to pass to Siobhan, Andy... And Kate's going to. Okay, no problem at all. I'm just aware of time at I'm this stage, so if we can can keep it rocking on. I know with having four people um, speaking, it, we could go into an hour, to be honest. But um, if we could keep it as succinct as possible, because I know members would would appreciate the opportunity to have questions to you. Certainly. Go on thank ahead. You, Chair, thank you. Uh, first of all, can I thank the committee for prioritising its consideration of the welfare reform mitigations um, and for inviting the Cliff Ed Coalition today to speak to you along with the department and, and members of the uh, working group. Um, a couple of things just to respond to very quickly in relation to what we've heard already this morning. Um, I want to uh, firstly welcome the recognition of the importance of, of, of independent advice and, and that's really at an important time because at the end of March we are moving into a new time period for a new advice strategy. Mm -hmm. um, so there are important conversations to be had and this is an important opportunity to do that. Um, I'd also like to welcome the commitment to co-design. Uh, a number of you were at a, a meeting that the Law Centre has been working with um, UC US. Um, and also with MenCap on, on PIP um, to really understand and, and surface some of the challenges uh, that people are experiencing. So that commitment to co-design is, is, is very welcome. What I want to do is simply set the context out for what you're going to hear in terms of some of the detail from my colleagues, but I think it's been very clear from what you've heard already uh, that the changes that have taken place to the social security system over the last 10 years now, this, <coughs> thing, this has been going on since 2010, have in essence stripped a lot of the security out of the system. Mm. And the, that's been widely felt, the impact of that has been widely felt. You see it in your constituencies on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, we see it in the, in the advice sector and in the organisations that my colleagues um, here are here to represent. Um, and that's the background against which you brought forward the last mitigations package. They have, it, it's been an important buffer. It has worked, uh, but it came with that cliff edge. Uh, we know that that's, uh, we know where we are with that, with the end of March fast uh, upon us. And so that was why last year, actually this, this month last year, uh, we came together uh, to form into what we call then the Cliff Edge Coalition. And that was very much in that context of the Lumen Cliff Edge, uh, where people would then fall into the harshest elements of the uh, changes that we've seen to the social security system. And it was, of course, at that time without a, a, an assembly. So the first thing I would also like to say is just wel welcome back to have my welcome to that you've heard earlier today and acknowledge really the importance of the restoration of the assembly in driving forward this work. We're a coalition of over 100 members. You have in your briefing pack details of, um, of that. So we are uh, 
a, a, a wide body of organisations from across civic society. It's co-convened by the Law Centre and Housing Rights, but it's very much a coalition of the willing um, who have a shared commitment to uh, a, a created future that aligns with the executive's own vision of uh, people experiencing well-being and where everyone um, has the chance to live free of the burden of disadvantage and, and poverty that holds them back. And you heard that, members, last week at the UC at the US uh, event so clearly. So we gave evidence to the Westminster Committee. We met with the Minister um, shortly after her appointment to, to really give a signal about a collective sectoral message. So there are three key elements to that sectoral message that we want to outline to you today. The first one is extend these mitigations. And the recent announcement on the bedroom tax is therefore very welcome. It introduces some much needed security. We have heard from the department today that they are bringing forward three sets of regulations. We would welcome the committee's clarity uh, about what will happen specifically in relation to those other mitigations that do end on the 31st of March. And, and Siobhan will talk about, for example, the benefit cap, because we are very conscious our, our little icon is of the, the, uh, the sands of time. Uh, time is running out here. So our first message is extend. The second message is strengthen. There's a very clear commitment in the New Deal. Or sorry, New Decade, New Approach. I have to stop calling it New Deal. Um, the mitigation package that we put together in 2016 reflected the time it was off its time. We have since experienced new challenges and we are in a rapidly changing legal and policy environment. We've already been talking today about the two-child limit. Mm -hmm. So there's, that's listed for hearing in the Supreme Court. There's a challenge to that. Uh, it's listed in October 20th to the 22nd. I know you'll all be tuning in to watch the Supreme Court live on your YouTubes. So there <coughs> are cases that are ongoing that could change this landscape very, very quickly. Um, and one of course the big challenges since 2016 has been the gradual rollout of universal credit and what I would say is that we have not yet experienced the managed migration process. So again we have a chance now and an opportunity and this is the time to think about how do we prepare for that going forward. And the third element of our message is finally why do we need to do this? Why do we need to strengthen? Because our message would be we simply cannot afford not to. Um, the pressures that the changes to the social security system have put on people over the last decade have been well documented. They have been well rehearsed. It has led to an increase in reliance on food banks. We've seen increases in child poverty. Andy will talk about that. We've seen increases in debt, housing stress, and in some cases, destitution. And what was so exciting, I think, about the um, opportunity that is presented by the um, NDNA is that there is a commitment to um, looking at a range of anti-poverty initiatives. And uh, we think an approach which is about, we can't afford not to, prevent, prevention is, is really important. And, and resonates with the commitment in, 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 the, in the agreement. Um, I think you will know from your own offices, from your own surgeries, that the mitigations have made a difference for people. And the drive that was there to put them in place the first time round is so clearly still here. So to pass on, what I would like to say is the extension is a good start, but it's a start. We're hoping that that is the launch pad for the next step, which is strengthening. And there are three things to say about strengthening. One, strengthen the mitigations with some structural flexibility built into them. And by that, what I mean is, what you've heard already is that they need to be responsive to what rolls out before us. They need to be responsive to new challenges with sufficient flexibility to reprofile and redirect funds. Um, because we've heard already about the impact of the uh, cost of work allowance, for example, and the, the limited take up in the contingency fund. Strengthen with stakeholder involvement and strengthen as quickly as possible. Um, Anne's talked about those new regulations to come forward. There are key choices to be made. They, they impact on people. We'd like to see a, a very timely uh, legislative timetable, and we'd like to see this move at pace 
with appropriate screening and scrutiny built into that process. So we accept that there is an accelerated um, pressure at this point in time. That's the broad overview of the, the, the key message. But Siobhan is going to talk to you specifically about why this is our message in relation particularly to universal credit. Andy's going to talk about why this is our message in relation to what the impact is on other public services. And Kate's going to talk specifically about why this is our message because of the impact on housing. So I'll ask Siobhan to pick up. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I just want to start by reiterating um, Ursula's thanks to you as a committee for having Cliff Edge here today. I work for um, the Women's Support Network. We provide support and services to a network of 14 women's centres across Northern Ireland. And we are extremely proud to be a part of this coalition because we see uh, the impact of the welfare reform and austerity policies on the women that use the centres, not just on the women themselves, but on, also on their children and their families and their wider communities. Um, in terms of the impact on, on women, research shows that women are more disproportionately impacted by welfare reform. Um, and that's for a variety of reasons. They're more likely to claim social security benefits, more likely to be in low paid, uh, part time and um, insecure work often. And they're also more likely to be caring for children and other family members. Um, in the last year, we produced a research paper on the impact of austerity and welfare reform on women who live in disadvantaged and rural areas in Northern Ireland. And this research showed the overwhelmingly negative impact of these policies on their everyday lives. 78% of the women that we spoke to um, felt they had been, um, they'd had to make cutbacks or had been impacted in some way by welfare reform. So it's quite a substantial number um, of those women. Um, before I move on to talk about um, universal credit, just very briefly want to mention the um, importance of the benefit cap mitigation, particularly to women. Um, the statistics outlined that up to, it would affect up to 1,500 families, I think David updated that maybe to 1,800 earlier. Um, they stand to lose around £168 a month, which is a very substantial amount of money. <coughs> but 85% of the capped households are lone parents. 91% of lone parents are women. So this is very much a gendered aspect of welfare reform. So we'd be very keen to see um, the mitigation around the benefit cap continue because it's so important. And it's a huge amount of money to those households that are impacted um, by this um, benefit cap. In terms of uh, universal credit, then um, our research looked at the issues around universal credit and women specifically. So it has been described um, as discriminatory against women by design for a number of the features within it. For example, the single payment, which prioritises the main breadwinner who's often male. The lack of a second earner work allowance, often the second earner in the household is female. The increased conditionality, particularly for lone parents, and issues around the way childcare is paid um, as well. But one of the most problematic features, and this has been uh, mentioned already, is the initial five-week wait for um, the payment. Um, and you've all highlighted that's evidenced in your constituency work as well. It has been shown to be particularly dangerous for low-income families and for women. Um, and our research showed the difficulties that those women um, felt by, um, from the, the five-week wait. It caused them to struggle to put food on the table for their children. It caused them to struggle to afford basics. It caused them to have to go to food banks to approach charities such as St Vincent de Paul for help. And it also encouraged them to get into debt or further into debt than they were already. So women were asking us at focus group sessions, how does the government think I will feed my children? <coughs> and they were asking, how do you expect to live for five weeks without no money? Um, a woman from Greenway Women's Centre in East Belfast said, we had to wait six to seven weeks uh, on the first payment of, of universal credit. It was an absolute nightmare. We really struggled. We had to go to the food bank and call St Vincent de Paul for help. Another woman from Footprints Women's Centre just um, in the colony area of Belfast. I was diagnosed with breast cancer, cancer and had to stop work and claim universal credit. I have a three-year-old daughter. I had to eat, wait eight weeks on my first payment and had to use the food bank at Footprints for help. I felt punished for being ill and for being a single parent. 
and a woman from a women's centre in Derry said, I am a single parent with a baby boy. I had to wait seven weeks on my first universal credit payment. I didn't turn the heat on very much, go anywhere or do anything because I had no money. I had to ask my mum for help with groceries. No day goes by without thinking about or stressing about money. Um, just wanted to, to give you those as an indication of the, and I'm sure you've seen, you've all seen that in your own offices. In terms of solutions then, we would obviously like to see the extension of the benefit cap mitigation, as I've already outlined. Um, I was grateful to Andy for mentioning, for asking the question around the cost of work allowance. Um, that we're particularly keen on because it was to have a special weighting for lone parents which took into account the cost of child care and as you know this is important in Northern Ireland as we don't have the same access to subsidised child care as there are in other parts of the UK. Um, as well as that it was also a CEDAW recommend recommendation and they particularly picked up Northern Ireland as an example within the CEDAW um, concluding remarks so it is something that, that needs to be on the radar around child care. And would also like to see the introduction of a new one-off supplementary payment to help people um, on universal credit with the five-week wait. Um, as I've said before, the, the advance payments um, just push people uh, into a debt situation and sometimes that can leave them uh, you know, in a situation where they, they struggle to get out of it. Um, as Ursula said, we, we're very much making the case why we can't afford not to do anything about strengthening um, the mitigations. In terms of women, women are the shock absorbers of poverty in the household. So they will go without food, they'll go without clothes, they'll go without heat in order to make sure the other family members um, are, are taken care of when money is tight. Um, and that was very evident in the research that we did. Um, and the, the actions that they had to take in order to cope with um, welfare reform, as I said to you before about food banks, but also cutting back on essentials including food and not using the likes of fuel or electricity to save money. Um, and coincidentally, just on that, in relation to food bank use, research shows that lone parents are significantly overrepresented at food banks uh, compared to the general population. So you've got 22% versus 5% there. And again, if you consider that 91% of lone parents are women, um, that is also a very gendered um, issue. Um, and the woman we spoke to talked at length about the worry and stress um, about making ends meet, um, and that that impacted on their general health and well-being. So it goes beyond just putting food on the table, it goes into their health and well-being and that of their children as well. And I just want to finish very briefly with the, um, um, some more comments from, as the Minister terms, experts with experience. Um, a woman from Greenway Women's Centre said, as long as my two kids are fed and watered, I don't care if I eat. Um, another woman from the Women's Centre, Derry, my wee boy goes to school and I just pray he has no holes in his shoes. And a woman from one of the North Belfast focus groups, we never go out, we never get a holiday, we have no social life. Um, another woman from Greenway, how do you explain to a 12-year-old that mummy can't afford to give you any money? It made me feel really, really bad. Thank okay. you. Thanks. So I'm just going to speak um, briefly about the two-child limit, um, the impact it has on families and the impact it has on social work services. Um, the two-child limit restricts the child element of universal credit to the first two children in a family, um, third or subsequent children born to a family, low-income families, sorry, after the 6th of April 2017, only qualify for that support in cases of multiple birth and in cases where the child was conceived as a result of the rape, which is uh, an issue that we're not going to get into today, but one which Basel is fundamentally opposed to the presence of the rape clause. Uh, other exemptions are in cases where a child has been adopted or there is kinship care arrangement for um, a child. Um, in 2019, the Child Poverty Action Group and the Church of England um, published a report, it's called All Kids Count. Um, it was UK wide and it found that by 2023-2024, um, 300,000 more children will be in poverty because of the two child limit. It's not 300,000 total, 300,000 more. Um, 
Baswa NI estimates that 9,000 more children in Northern Ireland will be in poverty as a result of the two-child limit. The poverty is so prevalent in Northern Ireland in terms of um, uh, the, the, the problems we're seeing as social workers. Uh, it's led the chief social worker to describe poverty as being the wallpaper of practice uh, in Northern Ireland. <coughs> is, um, anti-poverty framework which he's published. Um, in terms of the solution and what needs to be done, um, Cliff Edge Coalition recommends the abolition of the universal credit to child limit for Northern Ireland um, or failing that specific measures to be introduced by the Northern Ireland Executive um, to mitigate against the disproportionate impact it will have on people in Northern Ireland. <coughs> Pardon me. Um, the NI Affairs Committee and Working Pensions Committee uh, report which was referenced earlier it recognises the disproportionate impact the two-child limit will have um, in families living here due to our larger average family sizes and that it serves to discriminate against families on the basis of community and religious background. Um, average family household size in the UK is 2.3 people. Uh, it's 2.54 in Northern Ireland and Catholic families it's 2.72. So there is a discriminatory element to the universal credit two-child limit. Um, now, there will be significant costs associated with abolition of the limit. Um, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission report has already been cited, and it estimates the cost as £56 million annually. It's a very detailed, in-depth uh, report, um, and I'm not saying that figure isn't correct. However, I would uh, encourage the department to conduct its own analysis. I think it may be higher and significantly so. If you look at simply the number of families with three children or more that received child tax credits in 2018, Multiply that, multiply that by the £2,780 that those families wouldn't receive under universal credit, you're looking at something like £87 million a year. That's a huge amount of money, um, but um, the message we are um, explaining today is that we can't afford to act. Failure to act will have huge financial and human costs associated with poverty. So what does that mean from a social work perspective? Um, there is a well-established link between a family's socio-economic circumstances and the chances their children will experience neglect or abuse, and as poverty worsens, those chances increase. Um, research published by Queen's Belfast in 2017 highlights that children living in the most deprived areas here are six times more likely to be placed on the Child Protection Register and four times more likely to become looked after by social services than those children in the most affluent areas. Um, the children, number of children in care of social services uh, is currently at its highest level since the Children Order and was introduced in 1995, and the number of children on the Child Protection Register is highest since 2011. And what I really want to emphasise now is the cost to services. Um, the cost of looking after children in care is huge. It's incredibly important services provided. But um, for residential care, the cost ranges from uh, approximately £164,000 to £299,000 per child per placement, um, depending on the residential facility. And the cost of a foster care placement is average is at £28,000. Um, now, for every 13 children in foster care, there's one child in residential care. So um, the foster care uh, option, which is cheaper, is the much more prevalently used. But the calculation Baz was worked out is that if you focus on those 9,000 children that we think are going to fall into poverty because of the two-child limit, government will save £6.6 .6 million annually by denying universal credit to the 2,380 families in which they live. But if as few as 158 of those children um, uh, fall into poverty uh, and, and, and result, sorry, um, as a result of falling into poverty become looked after by social services, um, the additional spending on care will have exceeded the amount saved by preventing access to universal credit for those households in which the children are living in poverty. So that's the impact in terms of children's services. Um, Northern Ireland is undeniably in the, in the grip of a mental health crisis. Um, it's recognised in the New Decade New Approach um, Agreement. Um, according to 28 figures, uh, Northern Ireland has the highest suicide rate in the UK, with 18.6 deaths per 100,000 people. And again, poverty is a key factor. Incidents of suicide are disproportionately represented in the most deprived areas of Northern Ireland. Of the 307 deaths by suicide in 2018, 64 were in the most deprived areas, compared to 14 in the least deprived. So as poverty increases, uh, growing demand won't be restricted to looked after children's services and mental health services. Um, there will be costs to health services, there will be costs associated with um, adverse childhood experiences, there will be impacts in terms of educational achievement, 
uh, and there would be increased risks of young people becoming involved in antisocial behaviour and crime. Um, the Joseph Rowntree Foundation estimated in a report published in 2016 that across the UK, £78 billion of public spending is allocated annually to deal with poverty and its consequences. So it's looking at health care, education, justice and social services. Um, and bear in mind, in 2016, the UK budget total expenditure was £772 billion. So you're talking close to 10% of budget to deal with the impacts of poverty. We can't afford not to act. It is imperative that universal credit to child limit is abolished for Northern Ireland. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Um, I'm going to follow the same structure as Andy and Siobhan, talk a little bit about the problem, a little bit about the solution, and a little bit about why the Cliff Edge Coalition thinks that we can't afford not to act. Before I do, I just wanted to say I'm very conscious we've given you a lot of information, a lot of detail. We're very happy to send through our speaking notes after this, if that would be of use to, to committee members. In terms of the problem, the most high profile problem in terms of welfare mitigations and housing is obviously bedroom tax, and rightly so. It is very important. The problem that I want to talk to you about is cuts to local housing allowance, which is not a new problem. In fact, arguably, cuts to local housing allowance have in effect meant that the bedroom tax has been operating in the private rented sector for 10 years now. However, the evidence about the extent of the problem and the impact on low-income households in Northern Ireland who live in this sector, and committee members will know that they live in this sector because they can't access social housing and they can't afford to own their own home, has never been more overwhelming. Local housing allowance, as most will know, is intended to cover the bottom third of the market, so private renters should receive enough to cover the rent in the cheapest third of properties in Northern Ireland. However, research carried out by Housing Rights last year has highlighted the cuts to this benefit have meant that local housing allowance is now only sufficient to cover the rent in one in ten properties. This research also showed that the problem has been getting worse. Since 2009, there has been a 75% reduction in properties available at this rate for people who rent privately and who rely on housing benefit to meet their rent. For those people who are affected, the research showed that the average shortfall in their rent ranges from £45 to £134 per month, depending on where you live. <coughs> As a housing advice organisation, those impacted by these cuts make up a disproportionate number of the calls that our advisors take every single day. Over 120,000 people in Northern Ireland, over 120,000 households in Northern Ireland live in the private rented sector, and just over half of those, or 57%, are reliant on housing benefit um, to pay their rent. In terms of the solution, in Northern Ireland, apart from the very obvious um, mitigation payment to mitigate the bedroom tax, in the social rented sector, our social landlords have done an awful lot of work to create an infrastructure of support around their tenants. There are um, financial inclusion officers, um, there are um, systems in place whereby um, social landlords try to prevent arrears from accruing, they work with their tenants. Um, but in the private rented sector, that doesn't exist. That same infrastructure of support just doesn't exist, and that's a product of um, private rented sector being the private rented sector, but it's also a, an indicator of the, the sector being a sector comprised of landlords who own one or two properties. So there has been no capacity in that sector for those landlords to, to provide that support, and government up to now hasn't provided that additional infrastructure of support. And that's what the Cliff Edge Coalition is, is proposing. Um, specifically, we are proposing that a ring fence fund is set aside to support services which are designed to provide practical support to low income households who are living in the private rented sector. We are currently carrying out research to inform what those services exactly would look like based on best practice examples elsewhere. So it's based on looking at what's happening in Scotland, what's happening in England, what's happening in New Zealand and other places um, where, where people successfully live in the private rented sector um, who are on low incomes. We are also speaking with people who are directly affected, so those people who contact our advice services, what are the, the issues that they're facing in terms of accessing and sustaining their accommodation. And we're working with the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and their staff to ascertain their views. That research is due to be completed by the end of March and we hope that it would very much inform the discussion about what precisely those services could look like so that once there is ring-fenced funding set aside to, um, to, to deliver those services, that could be taken forward. 
In terms of why we can't afford not to act, um, very obviously um, there's a trend here you'll see in terms of poverty. Um, there's also very specifically in the case of the private rented sector a very specific case to be made in terms of prevention of homelessness, which is the policy direction of this government. In terms of homelessness, an expert review of homelessness in Northern Ireland carried out by independent experts from Harriet Watt University and published only last month specifically highlighted the significance of the cuts to local housing allowance for homelessness in Northern Ireland. This review echoed the observation made by the Northern Ireland Audit Office in their 2017 report that loss of rented accommodation is consistently one of the top three reasons for homeless presentations in Northern Ireland. According to the Department's most recent statistics, 15% or roughly 3,000 people of those who presented as homeless in 2018-19 did so because they lost their rented accommodation and overwhelmingly they lost accommodation in the private rented sector. The average annual cost to the North Ireland public pur pur purse of each homeless presentation was estimated back in 2015 to range from almost £5,000 to over £36,000, depending on the complexity of the situation, with the average deemed to be 15470 Taking even the lowest estimated cost of homelessness per person per year, it is possible to crudely estimate that by addressing the impact of local housing allowance cuts, there is a potential annual saving which runs into the millions of pounds to the homeless budget. In terms of poverty, we know from research carried out by the Nevin Economic Research Institute that there is a very well evidenced link between your housing circumstance and your experience of poverty. In Northern Ireland, there are actually more households at risk of poverty after housing costs living in the private rented sector than in the social rented sector. Initial findings from the research that we're carrying out right now that I had referred to just a few minutes ago also spoke of the experience of people who are prioritising paying their rent over everything else because they have ha either had previous experience of being evicted or because they know that the sector is so precarious that the risk of not paying their rent will almost certainly result in eviction. I wanted to end by giving you two very short quotes um, from some of the people who took part. Jade is on a zero hours contract and she told us that after paying her rent they literally had nothing left. We had no food in the cupboards. When it comes to the rent it's the biggest stress we have because we've been threatened with eviction before. Julia is a single mother who had split from her partner and she had £262 in her account when she was waiting for her first universal credit payment. She told us that the letting agent, when she rang them, said, if you pay all of that to us, at least you'll have the security of having a roof over your head. She said she asked the agent how she would feed her kids. Failure to address cuts to local housing allowance is therefore being directly expressed not just in homelessness presentations but in the experience of housing cost induced poverty. We look forward to taking members' questions. However, I just wanted to wrap up by giving you our three <coughs> points. The first is that we very obviously welcome the commitment to extend the mitigations. As Ursula said, we have been campaigning for over a year around that and we welcome the announcement that primary legislation will be brought forward around the bedroom tax. We would request clarity and we echo many of the comments made earlier today around exactly how in the time frame and the detail around how the other mitigations will be extended. We also hope that the new mitigation package will be developed in such a way that it is flexible to responding to the changing legal environment that we're in that Ursula referred to. And with the Assembly back in place, we also hope that the package can be kept under review so that any underspend can be quickly redirected so that it helps the people that it should. Secondly, we welcome the commitment to review with a view to strengthening the package, and it would be very useful to have a timetable for that review. We warmly welcome the Minister's commitment to work with stakeholders, including, and very specifically, including people directly affected by social security changes. We have detailed the areas that we feel are very important. And I wanted to say, because I'm sure it will be one of your questions, that the areas that we have prioritised in the Cliff Edge Coalition, there are three key areas. They are informed by the views and experiences of 105 organisations. They are informed by the views and experiences of people that we work with every day. And they are informed by best practice evidence and research. It is not a wish list. It is a very pragmatic assessment of need. And as we have identified, it will actually be more cost effective to address these issues head on um, instead of trying to meet the costs at a later stage in terms of poverty, in terms of homelessness. 
But the very last point that I wanted to say, and then I'll stop, is that <coughs> it's our view that this shouldn't just be about money. It should be about people. And it's the opportunity that the government has right now to do things better, exactly in the same way, in the same vein that we did things better whenever we brought in the mitigation package in the first place. And it's an opportunity to realise our commitments around tackling objective need, promoting well-being and prioritising people and their interests. Thank you all. Um, thank you for your presentations. Um, you <coughs> mentioned there you have given us quite a lot of information um, that you'll send on your speaking notes. But further to that, um, one of the issues that, that I have, and I'm sure other members of the committee has, is there's a lot of anecdotal evidence. It's the objective evidence that we need as a committee that helps to prove, like, for instance, Siobhan, when you talked about the food bank usage, you mentioned 22% um, of people who are single families oh, using, single mothers using food bank. That type of evidence um, and where you have that from, if you could um, provide us with that, lay it in the library here or provide it through, to, especially to our committee clerks, um, it means then that we have the evidence um, for moving forward. Um, that would be very much appreciated. Um, as you said, um, Kate, there at the end, this is about people. Um, at this moment in time, um, we know that budgets are all being talked about next week is the, is the start of the process to talk about what this year's financial budget is, and then we will get the budget bill for next year. Um, so when we're thinking about people and trying to protect people, there are certain things um, that we have to be mindful of, as you can imagine, as politicians and as this committee. So it's just to sort of, if all of you could have a think about this, um, You've recommended the cost of work allowance comes in. We've heard today that's about 37 million. Um, you also support the four additional recommendations stemming from the Human Rights Commission report, which was 71 million, as well as the abolition of the two child limit, which is not 56 million, as you say, Andy, it's up to 87 million, you think. Um, that's with the department's amount or the Human Rights Commission's amount, the 56 million, it takes it to 164 million a year um, on top of the and that's additional funding that's needed on top of the 42 million already identified by our minister. Um, so that's <coughs> 200 million. Um, communities is not health or education um, that do receive the majority of budget uh, or the majority of, of what people want budget to be spent on. Have you any thoughts as to the argument, what would be the priorities, what should come first, what should be looked at? Um, because if Westminster isn't bringing forward the money to us and we have to spend this out of the Northern Ireland Block Grant, what, what is it that we take forward first? Um, I, I think just in terms of that, I suppose the starting point for us, and you will have noticed in all of our evidence we have talked about why we can't afford not to, and we have been very specific in addressing the costs to other services, so it would be definitely our view that this shouldn't be a cost that's borne by communities alone. Um, rather, um, there is the potential to generate savings right across the executive. Um, so I, I wouldn't um, have as my starting point that this ha has to all come out of the community's budget. The second um, uh, point that we would make, I suppose, is that we realise that this is a lot of money. Um, we have <coughs> there there. Our instances, for example, we could have proposed in relation to cuts to local housing allowance that there was a supplementary payment that would that would address the complete deficit um, between them. We recognise that there are um, limited other supports available for private renters, such as discretionary housing payments. Um, even those that they're part of the response, so we haven't said um, we haven't went as far as we could have went. It is, in our view, very pragmatic to put forward. Um, the suggestions that we have in relation to that. Andy kind of made reference to it um, a little bit. I think part of the, the reviews process and part of the co-design process also needs to be the part, you know, sharing accurate information and looking at creative ways to address these issues. Um, because it's it's you know it's very difficult for us as civil society organisations to have access to all the information we need to make the most evidence-based um, contribution that we want to make. Some of that information is held by government. Some of that information hasn't yet um, even been, been properly looked at. Um, I think you'd asked us, is there an area we would prioritise? Um, no, we wouldn't. We, these are the areas that we have prioritised. Um, we wouldn't go in <coughs> any, any further than that. Um, there will need to be a political decision made around this, and we, we accept that that's the eventuality. However, we would encourage government, I suppose, in the context of the programme for government, to look at the outcomes that we're trying to achieve and then look at how these areas 
will support the achievement of those outcomes and look at how budgets from across the executive can contribute to that. Um, just to follow up to that, the Minister is already committed to review the mitigation measures. The programme for government has been rewritten by the executive, so the, what was before and will not necessarily be what we see coming out of the executive. We Absolutely. Haven't, we um, haven't seen that yet. No. But, but what, what I would like to ask is, if that review by the Minister, the commitment is there from the Minister yeah. to take that forward, my concern will be that we get a wish list of everything and we involve stakeholders in that discussion. And we may not be able to provide everything. Um, <coughs> I'm just worried about bringing people up to the top of the hill and then leave them at the cliff edge. Um, I think we need to be very honest but about that financial position. Um, we don't know what's going to happen out of the Westminster budget in March. Um, will there be extra money for this? Will there not be extra money for this? Um, and I'm just concerned, how can we support people so that we don't give them false hope that there's going to be something wonderful happening? We hope there will be, but and well, we would prefer that, but just how I, do we manage expectations? Can I say something about that? Because uh, it, it was one of the issues that surfaced um, at a meeting with UCU, UCS. Um, and I think one of the, I think what Kate has already said is, this doesn't sit with any one department. Mitigation measures are part of, and, and at the core of a range of measures that need to be taken. And that spans education, it spans health. This is this has genuinely got to be a cross departmental and an executive owned approach. Uh, and without in any way underestimating some of those challenges, um, I think one of the important things to remind ourselves of is that there is a cost to many of these measures, and there are other <coughs> things that can be done that can make a very significant difference to how people <coughs> experience a challenging system. That was very clearly the message that came from the UCUS, Agreed. and I think yeah. that there was a and there was a, a very clear degree of pragmatism around that table and understanding about that. So in terms of managing expectations, I think that's best done with people. Mm -hmm. okay. Chair, I if I may, um, the department in, in the new decade, new approach, mm -hmm. it talks about the anti-poverty strategy, which I believe would sit with the uh, communities department. That's going to have to be cross-departmental to make any sense, you know, because it's going to have to take in health, it's going to have to take in education, it's going to have to take in justice, it's going to have to sit and work alongside the economy strategy. Um, but until the department conducts an analysis of the costs of not mitigating, it can't make an informed decision um, of the costs to mitigate, mm -hmm. um, if you understand. Um, so that would be a first step, you know. Um, if you th even thinking like in health, and, and I know Mark was previously on the health committee, everyone around the table will be aware of the Bengoa report in terms of health. Big focus there is early intervention, you know, um, services delivered in the community because there are savings to uh, some people get into acute hospitals. I know this is not your remit by any means, but just in terms of that principle, the principle of intervening early, you prevent the um, you, you prevent poverty from developing. It's cheaper to deal with that than it is to deal with the consequences of poverty. Absolutely, there are a lot of strategies coming up, and I would strong the strength of of the coalition is the the breadth of knowledge that you have. And to be honest, I think it'd be vital the anti poverty strategy, the child care strategy. There's going to be a gender strategy coming through. Lots of this needs that input, but a strategy could be written over whatever period of time and eventually will come out. And yes, it, sh it will be cross-cutting, but it's having your voice in that and hopefully they'll move on quickly, but goodness knows how long that will be. I'll move on to members. Carol, you've indicated. So, thank you. Um, I mean, you've, you've sat through the this morning's presentation. You heard a lot of the questions that we asked. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kate, my questions are primarily for yourself because of my focus on housing um, or my spokesperson's role, but... One thing that it's very, very clear from the removal of the ring fence on, on the social housing development programme in 2008 and 2009, particularly in areas of highest demand, there's a bigger impact in terms of the private rented sector, and we can see that borne out. Um, and unfortunately, um, for people living in the private rented sector, there's no security of tenure. Um, and for government, there's more housing benefit get into the private rented sector and what there is the social rented sector. Now, I know, like, further on down the line, if you're talking about what would you do differently, there'd be loads of things. And for an anti-poverty strategy to be completely effective, it does have to be cross-cutting. But what you are asking is, in my opinion, completely reasonable. The affordability is going to be another issue, but it is completely reasonable. 
And, and I don't know if that work about providing the cost of not being, you know, providing the mitigations, if that can be done in advance of the regs coming forward. But, um, but certainly at Evelyn just have I mean, you're working with the department anyway, it needs to be brought forward. My, my concern really is, like discretionary housing payment is what it says, it's discretionary to the mm -hmm. housing local man management, and so is the local housing allowance as well for that matter. And there, not only is there a bigger impact on gender, but there's also geographical impacts as well. So the areas that suffer from most deprivation are greatest impacted. So in North and West Belfast, as examples, but but South, because of the the supply of the private rented sector, um, we are seeing you know adverse poverty right across the board, but particularly. And then you've got the rural end because of lack of transport and all the rest. When you're talking about costing in not being able or the you know costing in the the the, the issue of the government not doing this, mm -hmm. we also need to factor in the contributions from food banks and things like that. Absolutely. You know, that needs to happen. So and I don't know how that happens, but there's a lot of there's a lot of goodwill in the new decades new approach. There's a lot of goodwill in terms of everybody now supporting the mitigations and and then some. But I think for me this is this is the floor rather than the ceiling. And we do definitely and I know there are gonna be issues, but it is the floor rather than the ceiling and the quicker we can get the mitigations continued and the quicker that we can get the legislation to close the loopholes on bedroom tax and benefit cap, the better. And then we just need to systematically, I think that's what you were getting at, Kelly, systematically. It's not that anybody's saying we can't do any of this, it's yeah. just what do we need to do first and when and then what come. And that in itself is a very subjective process, yeah. but it is something I think every one of us want to be in a place where we're all trying to give the department, the minister, and each other as best support as possible. And um, we've all heard bedroom tax first, then benefit cap, and then it kind of peters off after that, depending on who you talk to, to be honest. So um, I would just, you know, if you are in any discussions with the department, you know, the for for me, the, the and you have identified it, it's getting those loopholes closed as quickly as possible and getting the contingency funds made available when you're making an application for universal credit. For me, that's, Absolutely. you know, because if people don't know the funds are, then the desk inevitable. And I don't like accepting poverty as yeah. inevitability. I don't think anybody does, so. That's one of the biggest problems, I think, around the contingency fund is that, that people don't know it's there. Yeah, they, they don't. They just don't know. And in and, and the focus group sessions we held with local women, I mean, they, they don't know what the, the name mitigation means or a supplementary payment means or, you know, they know that they're getting a certain amount of money, but they don't know it's mitigation. So there is a bit of uh, work to be done around you know, communication with the message and letting people know that that, 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 that money is there because they just simply don't know what's there at the moment. Yeah. I think just in terms of some of the points that you raised, Carol, um, all of us have tried to present evidence where it exists and where exactly. it's readily available in terms of why we can't afford not to do this. Yeah. I think my sense is that there is an overwhelming need for a more comprehensive assessment mm -hmm. of um, mm -hmm. the cost of not doing this and it is Andy's <coughs> point around that and perhaps then that will give us clues mm -hmm. about you know the areas the areas that we need to focus on our attention immediately it has always been the coalition's priority that the, the that people don't face the cliff edge so it has always been our number one priority that the current mitigations are extended. Yeah. We have always worked through and consistently throughout the process in each of our own organisations. We've been highlighting loopholes in other areas, I suppose, specifically in terms of housing. Obviously, the supply of social housing is the backdrop to so many of the issues that we talk about in housing, and it is definitely in terms of local housing loans. We raised the point about discretionary housing payments, and I, I wanted just to pick up on that because it is an important part 
of the support that is available to people. However, if you look at the budget for this year, it's around £5 million, and according to the Housing Executive, they're very close to the wire in terms mm -hmm. of meeting that. And we know that only about a third of people who are eligible for discretionary housing payments actually apply for one. We know that the average amount of the award is about £11 per week, which is much less than the shortfall. But again, the they shortfall. don't know about it. They don't know about it either. Exactly. Um, one of the people who took part in our research said she texted all her friends afterwards saying, did you know there's this thing called a DHP and you can get it? Um, I suppose the other point that comes to mind as well is that if we're serious about looking at these issues in the round and looking at how the executive as a whole can, has an obligation in terms of anti-poverty, maybe we should be thinking about how we screen um, policy proposals going forward as well. Um, like for example, one of the issues that the Minister will be considering, and I'm sure that this committee um, will be looking at it in due course in relation to housing, is the proposal to um, discharge the homeless duty by placing people in the private rented sector, which housing rights is very, very, very opposed to. Um, but if there was a consideration, if there was a screening process where you said, how will this contribute to poverty? How will this contribute to homelessness? And you absolutely wouldn't do it. Um, so I, I suppose there's probably a number of different new ways of working that we can take from um, the mitigations. And as Ursula said, it's not just about the mitigations, it's about how the rest of the policy gets okay. into place around it. Thank you. Thank you. Could I just ask in a follow-up to that about this evidence provision? Um, having worked in the community and voluntary sector, the social return investment model was yeah. the one where you would say, if you spend X pounds on this, it means that you're not going to, you know, which means that. I know a lot of the coalition would work through that type of um, reporting mechanism that's usually called for for government department funds. Um, is there any way that, that there could be, I don't want to give you more work, but it is time is of the essence, um, if there's evidence from your members, would that be able to be pulled together? Because you guys know, like the £37 million spent on the cost of work allowance will <coughs> enable <coughs> XYZ, which is a savings of, if there's something like that that can come forward, that would be quite useful. I think we're very happy to compile what evidence If there's something have. like that, that would be brilliant. Um, yeah. In terms of an SRA, having sat through the <coughs> training course in the SRA, it, it would take months I know. to do in a comprehensive way, and there's, there's distractors from the SRA yeah. process too. Yeah. But I think your point is, what is the economic value of... And absolutely, we'd be very happy to supply any additional evidence we have, and we would encourage others, and we can, we can put that call out to the rest of the coalition as well in case they have additional evidence. We have it's it's really, really valuable, like the the you see us um having the anecdotal, having the, the human um face of what this means. But when we're talking to bean counters, we need to have that sort of factual evidence as well. Um thank you very much. Robin, you've indicated Yeah, thank you, Chair, and uh, welcome the, the, the delegation. Uh, I suppose um, all of what you have in place is um, underpinning uh, what might be regarded as a caring society and right across the whole aspect of a caring society. You've already recognised that it's not just one department that this comes from and the need to work cross-departmentally on, on the issues. Can I, uh, maybe to Kate, uh, address the one issue? I mean, uh, the one category of person that I find coming into my office uh, is uh, the most vulnerable are young men, yeah. young single men who have been in rented accommodation and the impact of that, um, well, for whatever reason the landlord wants to, uh, to, to put them out and uh, them finding other accommodation and it seems to be well nigh impossible. The impact of that on those young people and indeed, I suppose, in many cases, their family uh, and kids. Could you say something around what you think might be the solution to that particular problem? Um, well, young people in particular, um, so those under 35, are, impact are impacted by specific cuts to local housing allowance. Um, they find it very difficult to access social housing. Um, so they tend to find their home in the private rented sector, and they tend to find a home that they find it very difficult to afford and sustain. There's also a lack of availability, as members will know, of those sort of one bedroom, um, <laughs> small unit accommodation. So you tend to find that a lot of a lot of young people, a lot of young men in particular, um, are, are are impacted most severely by a lot of these these um, sort of a lot of different areas of housing policy, which kind of come together at a confluence. Um, in terms of what the what the solution 
um, would be um, for those young men in particular. There is there are huge demands for social housing. There are um, very significant um, issues around the provision of private rented accommodation for these young people or these young people as well. I think we need to seriously look at a review of the of the role and regulation of the private rented sector and how you can best meet the needs of people who live there. Um, that work is ha has been undergone um, by the department for a while, um, but obviously with the absence of, of an assembly, um, they were stalled in terms of what make, of what um, recommendations and what actual practical delivery they could bring forward. I think the climate has changed a wee bit since the last time the department looked at it, and the issue around affordability has now become even more important. Um, so I think in our, certainly in our conversations with the department, um, and it's, it's very obvious that, they, that they've taken this on board, the issue around affordability, particularly in the private rented sector, needs to be seriously considered. And one of the difficulties around that is that the answer to it is not just the housing answer. There's social security issues. Um, and you know we've seen some good practice in terms of the department coming to get bringing those two sides of the department coming together to look at issues. Um, but we'd like to see further development of it as well. I also think um, that there is a need for the experiences and the voices of those young men that you talk about um, to be more a part of the policy answer. And I, I, I accept the categorise, categorisation of, of those comments as anecdotal, but I think just because they're anecdotal doesn't mean they don't have an awful mm -hmm. lot of value. Um, we tend to find in the sort of participative work that we've started doing that you don't get an awful lot of young men um, who come. So we need to be better at going out and, and, trying, to, and trying to engage with them. I don't know if that fully answers your question. I don't know if there is a full answer at the minute. I think it's a combination of a number uh, of different. I, I, I think if, if <laughs> uh, I don't know that there is a, an answer at this moment in time, but I think it's a problem that society yeah. is going to feel the implications of if we don't actually address it. However, it is addressed, and it may be yeah. that it needs a, a multidisciplinary approach to address it rather than just building more single uh, uh, apartments. Yeah. Mark. Uh, okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, everyone, for that uh, presentation. It's good to hear, I suppose, from such a, a range of organisations with such a breadth and depth of experience and, and knowledge. I, I won't get into the, the minutia of some of the stuff we, we've been talking about here, but just to, to go back, I suppose, to to the bigger piece, the most important thing of all, I suppose, as to where this money is going to come from, that we do need, that we can't afford not to find. Uh, as uh, you put it, and I mean, we're talking here about welfare mitigations, but the department is also home to a whole suite of strategies that are extremely important in, in their own right. We're going to have to keep coming back to this question of where the money is going to come. Uh, I think it would be very appropriate to look at the re-establishment of some sort of cross Cotton Executive Programme Fund. They, they used to exist here many moons ago and were done away with without good uh, reason because this is so cross cutting and so many departments are impacted and will be impacted greatly by, by our failure to in invest in these mitigation uh, measures. Obviously, there's education, health, uh, the economy is a, is a big one. Mm -hmm. I mean, there will be many people who aren't on benefits or are fortunate enough to be or think that they are removed from this whole debate, but I mean the impact of taking these millions and millions of pounds out of our local economy would be felt everywhere by everyone and would actually end up costing people mm -hmm. in hospitality and hairdressers and taxis or whatever, costing them jobs and pushing them towards that precipice and, and, and to poverty. So, uh, again, thank you. I think it's, it's extremely important that we look collectively as parties around the executive table and even those who aren't in the executive at, at how we make these things sort of. Yeah. We're all in support of mitigations, but it, they have to be sufficient and they have to be sustainable, and they're not going to be if they're the responsibility of one department that tries to ring fence at, at the expense of so many other functions, like supporting people, like housing itself. That, that, that's just a non-runner. Thank you. Um, just before we finish up, no other member has indicated. Um, uh, 
Andy, you raised about the rape clause. Um, I'm very aware of the, the strength of the coalition. I was just actually wondering, um, have you had any um, discussions with the Department of Justice on the issue, uh, especially in regards to um, you know, having to report the offence to the police when it's, when it's against the person's wishes? Yeah, we had some conversations going back probably most of two years with Department of Justice officials. So obviously while there was no executive in place, <clears throat> Uh, Alva had taken legal advice. Um, this is a clarified situation, and what we were told was, um, by our QC was that um, there was no ambiguity. Um, if a social worker, or a GP, or a nurse, or a midwife is notified of a rape in the in the process of a universal credit application, they are bound to then go and report that to the police. And it's under Section Five of the 1967 Criminal Law Act. And just to make it really clear, that uh, is different from the, the situation in GB. Yeah. So you had a policy drafted in Whitehall, which had UK-wide um, application that didn't pay any heed to the specific uh, situation here. Um, and yeah, we did discuss with uh, DOJ officials um, potential ways to, to um, address the issue. In the interim, um, the Attorney General actually published human rights guidance, um, which um, in essence um, explained that it would be pretty much um, it would be highly, highly unlikely that a case would ever be taken against a social worker or nurse or GP for not reporting that to the police. However, that doesn't address what is actually sitting in legislation at the moment, um, and it's an issue we'd like to see addressed. I know there's been legal precedent. Uh, the Sexual Offences Order, um, I think it's 2008, um, uh, um, has application in relation to Section 5, where it doesn't decriminalise um, uh, underage sex between uh, people aged under 16, but if uh, um, if both partners are under the age of 18, it's not a requirement then to report that to police. Um, so there is there is legal precedent for how Section 5 has been um, amended, uh, and so, that's, so we believe there is an opportunity for it to be amended in relation to social workers' involvement in relation to uh, universal credit applications. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And please pass on our thanks to all of your, our coalition yeah. members. Thank um, you. It is appreciated. Um, you do have strength in numbers. And um, to be honest, we've all heard you today. We've heard from many of your members. Um, please pass on our, our best wishes to each one of them. And we look Thank forward you. probably to talking to you again on a few occasions. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Members, we're moving on now to um, agenda item number eight. Any other business? We have nothing here. Anybody else have anything? Um, agenda 9 is date and time location of the next meeting. Next week, members, we have the ministers joining us as well as a briefing from the Deputy Secretary on Housing, which we didn't get covered last week. We were also scheduled to have a pre-legislative briefing on the Liquor Licensing Bill. Um, we thought we'd take the meetings in the morning from the Minister on her priorities for the remainder of the mandate and on the liquor licensing and then have a separate session in the afternoon about housing, given how long it can take for all of this in the interest that we'll be in it. However, this committee room is booked in the afternoon and we don't have any other accommodation. So what we would like to propose Sorry. is that we perhaps move the liquor licensing, yeah. if that's okay with yourselves, to the 5th of March. Yeah. Uh, but see the liquor licensing, is that when's the legislation proposed to be brought forward in the assembly? Right. First stage was the end of March, I think Aye. she said. Yeah. Someone says so that's a pre legislative briefing on the proposals. Yeah. So it's not the actual legislation, so it's it's we'll get that briefing but Can we just swap them if we could swap the housing and liquor license and one around because if it's, it's possible. A time imperative on the Aye, because we, we all think we were all led to believe it's coming at the end of March. So, mm. what about that? Uh, so, sure. Is the case you want to hear from the minister and then here on liquor licensing? Yeah. And will you and want we'll to move Louise to? Yeah. 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 Sure. Yeah. Can I just indicate that there's a slight issue with that in that uh, the. the You'd wanted to hear from the, all the deputy sectors before we had no idea. Yeah. So you won't have but heard from the housing. But the, see, see, to be honest, um, that's with intention. It's not realistic. We've tried. Wouldn't worry about it. We we're having it with earlier. We discussed about the away day being on the twelfth. So if we hear from Louise on the fifth, with with those other two deputy secretaries are coming on the fifth as well, are they? That that. Oh, that's Louise. That's, and, that's the case. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it may well be the fifth. 
Yeah, the fifth will be uh, a busy meeting. A very I'll try to ensure there is afternoon accommodation for that day, maybe then. Well, that's what we're saying. Oh, on the fifth. Yeah. yeah. I don't know how we're so. I think so. I think it's fully. It's fully. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Uh, I suppose you're. Move the way day back. We can do that. I mean, we can push that f- further into into March. If so wish. I mean, it's, but, you know. Hmm. We can work out so members are content, then we'll get back to you with a date yeah. about the way day, and we'll... Down, thank you. But now, then, our next meeting, then, will be um, at 10 o'clock on Thursday, the 27th of February, in here, room 29, Parliament Buildings. Mm. Thank you, Mark. Thank, thank you. you. Meeting is over. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.